Cheese by G. K. Chesterton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jerome Lawson. Cheese by G. K. Chesterton. My forthcoming work in five volumes, The Neglect of Cheese in European Literature, is a work of such unprecedented and laborious detail that it is doubtful if I shall live to finish it. Some overflowings from such a fountain of information may therefore be permitted to sprinkle these pages. I cannot yet wholly explain the neglect to which I refer. Poets have been mysteriously silent on the subject of cheese. Virgil, if I remember right, refers to it several times but with too much Roman restraint. He does not let himself go on cheese. The only other poet I can think of just now, who seems to have had some sensibility on the point, was the nameless author of the nursery rhyme which says, If all the trees were bread and cheese, which is, indeed, a rich and gigantic vision of the higher gluttony. If all the trees were bread and cheese, there would be considerable deforestation in any part of England where I was living. Wild and wide woodlands would reel and fade before me, as rapidly as they ran after Orpheus. Except Virgil and this anonymous rhymer, I can recall no verse about cheese. Yet it has every quality which we require in exalted poetry. It is a short, strong word. It rhymes to breeze and seas, an essential point. That it is emphatic in sound is admitted even by the civilization of the modern cities. For the citizens, with no apparent intention except emphasis, will often say, cheese it, or even quite the cheese. The substance itself is imaginative. It is ancient, sometimes in the individual case, always in the type and custom. It is simple, being directly derived from milk, which is one of the ancestral drinks, not lightly to be corrupted with soda water. You know, I hope, even though I myself have only just thought of it, that the four rivers of Eden were milk, water, wine, and ale. Aerated waters only appeared after the fall. But cheese has another quality which is also the very soul of song. Once in endeavouring to lecture in several places at once, I made an eccentric journey across England, a journey of so irregular and even illogical shape that it necessitated my having lunch on four successive days in four roadside inns in four different countries. In each inn they had nothing but bread and cheese. Nor can I imagine why a man should want more than bread and cheese, if he can get enough of it. In each inn the cheese was good, and in each inn it was different. There was a noble Wensleydale cheese in Yorkshire, a Cheshire cheese in Cheshire, and so on. Now it is just here that true poetic civilization differs from that paltry and mechanical civilization which holds us all in bondage. Bad customs are universal and rigid, like modern militarism. Good customs are universal and varied, like native chivalry and self-defense. Both the good and bad civilization cover us as with a canopy and protect us from all that is outside. But a good civilization spreads over us freely like a tree, varying and yielding because it is alive. A bad civilization stands up and sticks out above us like an umbrella, artificial, mathematical in shape, not merely universal, but uniform. So it is with the contrast between the substances that vary and the substances that are the same wherever they penetrate. By a wise doom of heaven men were commanded to eat cheese, but not the same cheese. Being really universal, it varies from valley to valley. But if, let us say, we compare cheese with soap, that vastly inferior substance, we shall see that soap tends more and more to be merely Smith's soap, or brown soap, sent automatically all over the world. If the Red Indians have soap, it is Smith's soap. If the Grand Lama has soap, it is brown soap. There is nothing subtly and strangely Buddhist, nothing tenderly Tibetan, about a soap. I fancy the Grand Lama does not eat cheese, he is not worthy, but if he does, it is probably a local cheese, having some real relation to his life and outlook. Safety matches, tinned foods, patent medicines are sent all over the world, but they are not produced all over the world. Therefore there is in them a mere dead identity, never that soft play of slight variation which exists in things produced everywhere out of the soil, in the milk of the kine, or the fruits of the orchard. You can get a whiskey and soda at every outpost of the empire. That is why so many empire builders go mad. But you are not tasting or touching any environment, as in the cider of Devonshire, or the grapes of the Rhine. 
you are not approaching nature in one of her myriad tints of mood, as in the holy act of eating cheese. When I had done my pilgrimage in the four wayside public houses, I reached one of the great northern cities, and there I proceeded, with great rapidity and complete inconsistency, to a large and elaborate restaurant, where I knew I could get many other things besides bread and cheese. I could get that also, however, or at least I expected to get it, but I was sharply reminded that I had entered Babylon, and left England behind. The waiter brought me cheese, indeed, but cheese cut up into contemptibly small pieces, and it is the awful fact that, instead of Christian bread, he brought me biscuits. Biscuits, to one who had eaten the cheese of four great countrysides. Biscuits, to one who had proved anew for himself the sanctity of the ancient wedding between cheese and bread. I addressed the waiter in warm and moving terms. I asked him who he was that he should put asunder those whom humanity had joined. I asked him if he did not feel, as an artist, that a solid but yielding substance like cheese went naturally with a solid, yielding substance like bread. To eat it off biscuits is like eating it off slates. I asked him if, when he said his prayers, he was so supercilious as to pray for his daily biscuits. He gave me generally to understand that he was only obeying a custom of modern society. I have therefore resolved to raise my voice, not against the waiter, but against modern society, for this huge and unparalleled modern wrong. End of Cheese by G. K. Chesterton Dream Children, A Reverie by Charles Lamb Read by Joyce Berger This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dream Children, A Reverie Children love to listen to stories about their elders when they were children, to stretch their imagination to the conception of a traditionary great-uncle or grand-dame whom they never saw. It was in this spirit that my little ones crept about me the other evening to hear about their great-grandmother Field, who lived in a great house in Norfolk, a hundred times bigger than that in which they and Papa lived, which had been the scene, so at least it was generally believed in that part of the country, of the tragic incidents which they had lately become familiar with from the ballad of the children in the wood. Certain it is that the whole story of the children and their cruel uncle was to be seen fairly carved out in wood upon the chimney-piece of the great hall, the whole story down to the robin redbreasts, till a foolish rich person pulled it down to set up a marble one of modern invention in its stead, with no story upon it. Here Alice put out one of her dear mother's looks, too tender to be called upbraiding. Then I went on to say how religious and how good their great-grandmother Field was, how beloved and respected by everybody, though she was not indeed the mistress of this great house, but had only the charge of it, and yet in some respects she might be said to be the mistress of it too, committed to her by the owner, who preferred living in a newer and more fashionable mansion, which he had purchased somewhere in the adjoining county. But still she lived in it in a manner as if it had been her own, and kept up the dignity of the great house in a sort while she lived, which afterwards came to decay and was nearly pulled down and all its old ornaments stripped and carried away to the owner's other house, where they were set up and looked as awkward as if someone were to carry away the old tombs they had seen lately at the abbey and stick them up in Lady C.'s tawdry gilt drawing-room. Here John smiled as much as to say, That would be foolish indeed. And then I told how, when she came to die, her funeral was attended by a concourse of all the poor, and some of the gentry, too, of the neighborhood for many miles round, to show their respect for her memory, because she had been such a good and religious woman. So good, indeed, that she knew all the psaltery by heart, I and a great part of the testament besides. Here little Alice spread her hands. Then I told what a tall, upright, graceful person their great-grandmother Field once was, and how in her youth she was esteemed the best dancer. Here Alice's little foot played an involuntary movement, till upon my looking grave it desisted. The best dancer, I was saying, in the county, till a cruel disease called a cancer came, 
and bowed her down with pain. But it could never bend her good spirits or make them stoop, but they were still upright because she was so good and religious. Then I told how she was used to sleep by herself in a lone chamber of the great lone house, and how she believed that an apparition of two infants was to be seen at midnight, gliding up and down the great staircase near where she slept. But she said, those innocents would do her no harm, and how frightened I used to be, though in those days I had my maid to sleep with me, because I was never half so good or religious as she, and yet I never saw the infants. Here John expanded all his eyebrows and tried to look courageous. Then I told how good she was to all her grandchildren, having us to the great house in the holidays, where I in particular used to spend many hours by myself, in gazing upon the old busts of the twelve Caesars that had been emperors of Rome, till the old marble heads would seem to live again, or I to be turned into marble with them. How I never could be tired with roaming about that huge mansion, with its vast empty rooms, with their worn-out hangings, fluttering tapestry, and carved oaken panels, with the gilding almost rubbed out, sometimes in the spacious old-fashioned gardens which I had almost to myself, unless when now and then a solitary gardening man would cross me, and how the nectarines and peaches hung upon the walls without my ever offering to pluck them because they were forbidden fruit, unless now and then, and because I had more pleasure in strolling about among the old melancholy-looking yew-trees or the firs, and picking up the red berries and the fir apples, which were good for nothing but to look at, or in lying about upon the fresh grass with all the fine garden smells around me, or basking in the orangery, till I could almost fancy myself ripening too, along with the oranges and the limes in that grateful warmth, or in watching the dace that darted to and fro in the fish-pond at the bottom of the garden, with here and there a great sulky pike hanging midway down the water, in silent state, as if it mocked at their impertinent friskings. I had more pleasure in these busy idle diversions than in all the sweet flavors of peaches, nectarines, oranges, and such like common baits of children. Here John slyly deposited back upon the plate a bunch of grapes, which, not unobserved by Alice, he had meditated dividing with her, and both seemed willing to relinquish them for the present as irrelevant. Then, in somewhat a more heightened tone, I told how, though their great-grandmother Field loved all her grandchildren, Yet in a special manner she might be said to live their uncle, John L., because he was so handsome and spirited a youth, and a king to the rest of us. And instead of moping about in solitary corners like some of us, he would mount the most mettlesome horse he could get, when but an imp no bigger than themselves, and make it carry him half over the country in a morning, and join the hunters when there were any out. And yet he loved the old great house and gardens, too, but had too much spirit to be always pent up within their boundaries, and how their uncle grew up to man's estate as brave as he was handsome, to the admiration of everybody, but of their great-grandmother Field most especially, and how he used to carry me upon his back when I was a lame-footed boy, for he was a good bit older than me, many a mile, when I could not walk for pain, and how in after life he became lame-footed too, and I did not always, I fear, make allowances enough for him when he was impatient and in pain, nor remember sufficiently how considerate he had been to me when I was lame-footed, and how when he died, though he had not been dead an hour, it seemed as if he had died a great while ago, such a distance there is betwixt life and death, and how I bore his death as I thought pretty well at first, but afterwards it haunted and haunted me and though I did not cry or take it to heart as some do, and as I think he would have done if I had died, yet I missed him all day long, and knew not till then how much I had loved him. I missed his kindness, and I missed his crossness, and wished him to be alive again to be quarreling with him, for we quarreled sometimes, rather than not have him again, and was as uneasy without him as he, their poor uncle, must have been when the doctor took off his limb. Here the children fell a-crying, and asked if their little mourning, which they had on, was not for Uncle John, and they looked up, and prayed me not to go on about their uncle, 
but to tell them some stories about their pretty dead mother. Then I told how for seven long years, in hope sometimes, sometimes in despair, yet persisting ever, I courted the fair Alice W., and as much as children could understand, I explained to them what coyness and difficulty and denial meant in maidens, when suddenly, turning to Alice, the soul of the first Alice looked out at her eyes with such a reality of representment that I became in doubt which of them stood there before me, or whose that bright hair was. And while I stood gazing, both the children gradually grew fainter to my view, receding, and still receding, till nothing at last but two mournful features were seen in the uttermost distance which without speech strangely impressed upon me the effects of the speech. We are not of Alice, nor of thee, nor are we children at all. The children of Alice call Bartram father. We are nothing, less than nothing, and dreams. We are only what might have been, and must wait upon the tedious shores of Lethe millions of ages before we have existence and a name. And immediately awaking, I found myself quietly seated in my bachelor armchair, where I had fallen asleep, with the faithful Bridget unchanged by my side. But John L., or James Elia, was gone forever. 1822. End of Dream Children, a Reverie by Charles Lamb. The Man Who Thinks Backwards by G. K. Chesterton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jerome Lawson The Man Who Thinks Backwards by G. K. Chesterton The Man Who Thinks Backwards is a very powerful person today. Indeed, if he is not omnipotent, he is at least omnipresent. It is he who writes nearly all the learned books and articles, especially of the scientific or skeptical sort. All the articles on eugenics and social evolution and prison reform and the higher criticism and all the rest of it. But especially it is this strange and tortuous being who does most of the writing about female emancipation and the reconsidering of marriage. For the man who thinks backwards is very frequently a woman. Thinking backwards is not quite easy to define abstractedly, and, perhaps, the simplest method is to take some object, as plain as possible, and from it illustrate the two modes of thought. The right mode, in which all real results have been rooted. The wrong mode, which is confusing all our current discussions, especially our discussions about the relations of the sexes. Casting my eye around the room, I notice an object which is often mentioned in the higher and subtler of these debates about the sexes. I mean a poker. I will take a poker and think about it, first forwards and then backwards, and so perhaps show what I mean. The sage desiring to think well and wisely about a poker will begin somewhat as follows. Among the live creatures that crawl about this star, the queerest is the thing called man. This plucked and plumeless bird, comic and forlorn, is the butt of all the philosophies. He is the only naked animal, and this quality, once, it is said, his glory, is now his shame. He has to go outside himself for everything that he wants. He might almost be considered as an absent-minded person who has gone bathing and left his clothes everywhere, so that he has hung his hat upon the beaver and his coat upon the sheep. The rabbit has white warmth for a waistcoat, and the glowworm has a lantern for a head. But man has no heat in his hide, and the light in his body is darkness and he must look for light and warmth in the wild, cold universe in which he is cast. This is equally true of his soul and of his body. He is the one creature that has lost his heart as much as he has lost his hide. In a spiritual sense he has taken leave of his senses, and even in a literal sense he has been unable to keep his hair on. And just as this external need of his has lit in his dark brain the dreadful star called religion, so it is lit in his hand, the only adequate symbol of it. I mean the red flower called fire. Fire, the most magic and startling of all material things, is a thing known only to man, and the expression of his sublime externalism. It embodies all that is human in his hearths, and all that is divine on his altars. It is the most human thing in the world, 
seen across wastes of marsh or medleys of forest. It is veritably the purple and golden flag of the sons of Eve. But there is about this generous and rejoicing thing an alien and awful quality, the quality of torture. Its presence is life, its touch is death. Therefore, it is always necessary to have an intermediary between ourselves and this dreadful deity, to have a priest to intercede for us with the god of life and death, to send an ambassador to the fire. That priest is the poker. Made of a material more merciless and warlike than the other instruments of domesticity, hammered on the anvil, and borne itself in the flame, the poker is strong enough to enter the burning fiery furnace, and, like the holy children, not be consumed. In this heroic service it is often battered and twisted, but it is the more honorable for it, like any other soldier who has been under fire. Now all this may sound very fanciful and mystical, but it is the right view of pokers, and no one who takes it will ever go in for any wrong view of pokers, such as using them to beat one's wife, or torture one's children, or even, though that is more excusable, to make a policeman jump, as the clown does in the pantomime. He who has thus gone back to the beginning, and seen everything as quaint and new, will always see things in the right order, the one depending on the other in degree of purpose and importance, the poker for the fire, and the fire for the man, and the man for the glory of God. This is thinking forwards. Now our modern discussions about everything, imperialism, socialism, or votes for women, are all entangled in an opposite train of thought, which runs as follows. A modern intellectual comes in and sees a poker. He is a positivist. He will not begin with any dogmas about the nature of man, or any daydreams about the mystery of fire. He will begin with what he can see, the poker. And the first thing he sees about the poker is that it is crooked. He says, poor poker, it's crooked. Then he asks how it came to be crooked, and is told that there is a thing in the world, with which his temperament has hitherto left him unacquainted, a thing called fire. He points out, very kindly and clearly, how silly it is of people, if they want a straight poker, to put it into a chemical combustion which will very probably heat and warp it. Let us abolish fire, he says, and we shall have perfectly straight pokers. Why should you want a fire at all? They explain to him that a creature called man wants a fire, because he has no fur or feathers. He gazes dreamily at the embers for a few seconds, and then shakes his head. I doubt if such an animal is worth preserving, he says. He must eventually go under in the cosmic struggle, when pitted against well-armored and warmly protected species, who have wings and trunks and spires, and scales and horns, and shaggy hair. If man cannot live without these luxuries, you had better abolish man. At this point, as a rule, the crowd is convinced. It heaves up all its clubs and axes, and abolishes him. At least, one of them. Before we begin discussing our various new plans for the people's welfare, let us make a kind of agreement that we will argue in a straightforward way, and not in a tail-foremost way. The typical modern movements may be right, but let them be defended because they are right, not because they are typical modern movements. Let us begin with the actual woman or man in the street, who is cold, like mankind before the finding of fire. Do not let us begin with the end of the last red-hot discussion, like the end of a red-hot poker. Imperialism may be right, but if it is right, it is right because England has some divine authority like Israel, or some human authority like Rome, not because we have saddled ourselves with South Africa and don't know how to get rid of it. Socialism may be true, but if it is true, it is true because the tribe or the city can really declare all land to be common land, not because Herod's stores exist and the commonwealth must copy them. Female suffrage may be just, but if it is just, it is just because women are women, not because women are sweated workers and white slaves and all sorts of things that they ought never to have been. Let not the imperialist accept a colony because it is there, nor the suffragist seize a vote because it is lying about, nor the socialist buy up an industry merely because it is for sale. Let us ask ourselves first what we really do want, not what recent legal decisions have told us to want, or recent logical philosophies prove that we must want, or recent social prophecies predicted that we shall some day want. If there must be a British Empire, let it be British, and not, in mere panic, American or Prussian. If there ought to be female suffrage, let it be female, and not a mere imitation, as coarse as a male blackguard 
or as dull as the male clerk. If there is to be socialism, let it be social, that is, as different as possible from all the big commercial departments of today. The really good journeyman tailor does not cut his coat according to his cloth. He asks for more cloth. The really practical statesman does not fit himself to existing conditions. He denounces the conditions as unfit. History is like some deeply planted tree, which, though gigantic in girth, tapers away at last into tiny twigs, and we are in the topmost branches. Each of us is trying to bend the tree by a twig, to alter England through a distant colony, or to capture the state through a small state department, or to destroy all voting through a vote. In all such bewilderment he is wise who resists this temptation of trivial triumph or surrender, and happy, in an echo of the Roman poet, who remembers the roots of things. End of The Man Who Thinks Backwards Minorities vs. Majorities by Emma Goldman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rhonda Fetterman If I were to give a summary of the tendency of our times, I would say quantity. The multitude, the mass spirit, dominates everywhere, destroying quality. Our entire life, production, politics, and education, rests on quantity, on numbers. The worker who once took pride in the thoroughness and quality of his work has been replaced by brainless, incompetent automatons who turn out enormous quantities of things, valueless to themselves, and generally injurious to the rest of mankind. Thus quantity, instead of adding to life's comforts and peace, has merely increased man's burden. In politics, naught but quantity counts. In proportion to its increase, however, principles, ideals, justice, and uprightness are completely swamped by the array of numbers. In the struggle for supremacy, the various political parties outdo each other in the trickery, deceit, cunning, and shady machinations, confident that the one who succeeds is sure to be held by the majority as the victor. That is the only God. Success. As to what expense, what terrible cost to character, is of no moment. We have not far to go in search of proof to verify this sad fact. Never before did the corruption, the complete rottenness of our government stand so thoroughly exposed. Never before were the American people brought face to face with the Judas nature of that political body, which has claimed for years to be absolutely beyond reproach. As the mainstay of our institutions, the true protector of the rights and liberties of the people. Yet when the crimes of that party became so brazen that even the blind could see them, it needed but to muster up its minions, and its supremacy was assured. Thus the very victims, duped, betrayed, outraged a hundred times, decided not against, but in favor of the victor. Bewildered, the few asked how could the majority betray the traditions of American liberty? Where was its judgment, its reasoning capacity? That is just it. The majority cannot reason. It has no judgment. Lacking utterly in originality and moral courage, the majority has always placed its destiny in the hands of others. Incapable of standing responsibilities, it has followed its leaders even unto destruction. Dr. Stockman was right. The most dangerous enemies of truth and justice in our midst are the compact majorities, the damned compact majority. Without ambition or initiative, the compact mass hates nothing so much as innovation. It has always opposed, condemned, and hounded the innovator, the pioneer of a new truth. The oft-repeated slogan of our time is, among all politicians, the socialists included, that ours is an era of individualism, of the minority. 
only those who do not probe beneath the surface might be led to entertain this view. Have not the few accumulated the wealth of the world? Are they not the masters, the absolute kings of the situation? Their success, however, is due not to individualism, but to the inertia, the cravenness, the utter submission of the mass. The latter wants to be dominated, to be led, to be coerced. As to individualism, at no time in human history did it have less chance of expression, less opportunity to assert itself in a normal, healthy manner. The individual educator imbued with honesty of purpose, the artist or writer of original ideas, the independent scientist or explorer, the non-compromising pioneers of social change are daily pushed to the wall by men whose learning and creative ability have become decrepit with age. Educators of Ferrer's type are nowhere tolerated, while the dietitians of pre-digested food, a la Professors Elliot and Butler, are the successful perpetuators of an age of non-entities, of automatons. In the literary and dramatic world, the Humphrey Wards and Clyde Fitches are the idols of the mass, while but few know or appreciate the beauty and genius of an Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, an Ibsen, a Hauptmann, a Butler Yeats, or Stephen Phillips. They are like solitary stars far beyond the horizon of the multitude. Publishers, theatrical managers, and critics ask not for the quality inherent in creative art, but will it meet with a good sale? Will it suit the palate of the people? Alas, this palate is like a dumping ground. It relishes anything that needs no mental mastication. As a result, the mediocre, the ordinary, the commonplace, represents chief literary output. Need I say that in art we are confronted with the same sad facts? One has but to inspect our parks and thoroughfares to realize the hideousness and vulgarity of the art manufacture. Certainly none but a majority taste would tolerate such an outrage on art. False in conception and barbarous in execution, the statuary that infests American cities has as much relation to true art as a totem to a Michelangelo. Yet that is the only art that succeeds. The true artistic genius, who will not cater to accepted notions, who exercises originality, and strives to be true to life, leads an obscure and wretched existence. His work may some day become the fad of the mob, but not until his heart's blood had been exhausted, not until the pathfinder has ceased to be, and a throng of idealists and visionless mob has done to death the heritage of the master. It is said that the artist of today cannot create because, Prometheus-like, he is bound to the rock of economic necessity. This, however, is true of art in all ages. Michelangelo was dependent on his patron saint, no less than the sculptor or painter of today, except that the art connoisseurs of those days were far away from the madding crowd. They felt honored to be permitted to worship at the shrine of the Master. The art protector of our time knows but one criterion, one value, the dollar. He is not concerned about the quality of any great work, but in the quantity of dollars his purchase implies. Thus the financier in Mirbeau's Les Affaires sont les Affaires points to some blurred arrangement in colors, saying, See how great it is? It costs fifty thousand francs. Just like our own parvenu. The fabulous figures paid for their great art discoveries must make up for the poverty of their taste. The most unpardonable sin in society is independent of thought. That this should be so terribly apparent in a country whose symbol is democracy is very significant of the tremendous power of the majority. Wendell Phillips said fifty years ago, In our country of absolute democratic equality, public opinion is not only omnipotent, it is omnipresent. There is no refuge from its tyranny, there is no hiding from its reach, 
and the result is that if you take the old Greek lantern and go about to seek among a hundred, you will not find a single American who has not, or who does not fancy at least he has, something to gain or lose in his ambition, his social life, or business, from the good opinion and the votes of those around him. And the consequence is that instead of being a mass of individuals, each one fearlessly blurting out his own conviction, as a nation compared to other nations, we are a mass of cowards. More than any other people, we are afraid of each other. Evidently, we have not advanced very far from the condition that confronted Wendell Phillips. Today, as then, public opinion is the omnipresent tyrant. Today, as then, the majority represents a mass of cowards willing to accept him who mirrors his own soul and mind poverty. That accounts for the unprecedented rise of a man like Roosevelt. He embodies the very worst element of mob psychology. A politician, he knows that the majority cares little for ideals or integrity. What it craves is display. It matters not whether that be a dog show, a prize fight, the lynching of a nigger, the rounding up of some petty offender, the marriage exposition of an heiress, or the acrobatic stunts of an ex-president. The more hideous the mental contortions, the greater the delight and bravos of the mass. Thus, poor in ideals and vulgar of soul, Roosevelt continues to be the man of the hour. On the other hand, men towering high above such political pygmies, men of refinement, of culture, of ability, are jeered into silence as mollycoddles. It is absurd to claim that ours is the era of individualism. Ours is merely a more poignant repetition of the phenomenon of all history. Every effort for progress, for enlightenment, for science, for religious, political, and economic liberty emanates from the minority, and not from the mass. Today, as ever, the few are misunderstood, hounded, imprisoned, tortured, and killed. The principle of brotherhood expounded by the agitator of Nazareth preserved the germ of life, of truth, and justice, so long as it was the beacon of light of the few. The moment the majority seized upon it, that great principle became a shibboleth and harbinger of blood and fire, spreading suffering and disaster. The attack on the omnipotence of Rome was like a sunrise amid the darkness of the night, only so long as it was made by the colossal figures of a Huss, a Calvin, or a Luther. Yet when the mass joined in the procession against the Catholic monster, it was no less cruel no less bloodthirsty than its enemy. Woe to the heretics, to the minority, who would not bow to its dicta. After infinite zeal, endurance, and sacrifice, the human mind is at last free from the religious phantom. The minority has gone on in pursuit of new conquests, and the majority is lagging behind, handicapped by truth grown false with age. Politically, the human race would still be in the most absolute slavery, were it not for the John Balls, the Watt Tylers, the Tells, the innumerable individual giants who fought inch by inch against the power of kings and tyrants. But for the individual pioneers, the world would have never been shaken to its very roots by that tremendous wave, the French Revolution. Great events are usually preceded by apparently small things. Thus the eloquence and fire of Camille de Molins was like the trumpet before Jericho, raising to the ground that emblem of torture, of abuse, of horror, the Bastille. Always, at every period, the few were the banner-bearers of a great idea, of liberating effort. Not so the mass the leaden weight of which does not let it move. The truth of this is borne out in Russia with greater force than elsewhere. Thousands of lives have already been consumed by that bloody regime, yet the monster on the throne is not appeased. 
How is such a thing possible when ideas, culture, literature, when the deepest and finest emotions groan under the iron yoke? The majority, that compact, immobile, drowsy mass, the Russian peasant, after a century of struggle, of sacrifice, of untold misery, still believes that the rope which strangles the man with the white hands brings luck. The Intellectuals In the American struggle for liberty, the majority was no less of a stumbling block. Until this very day the ideas of Jefferson, of Patrick Henry, of Thomas Paine, are denied and sold by their posterity. The mass wants none of them. The greatness and courage worshipped in Lincoln have been forgotten in the men who created the background for the panorama of that time. The true patron saints of the black men were represented in that handful of fighters in Boston. Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, and Theodore Parker, whose great courage and sturdiness culminated in that somber giant, John Brown. Their untiring zeal, their eloquence and perseverance undermined the stronghold of the southern lords. Lincoln and his minions followed only when abolition had become a practical issue, recognized as such by all. About fifty years ago a meteor-like idea made its appearance on the social horizon of the world, an idea so far-reaching, so revolutionary, so all-embracing as to spread terror in the hearts of tyrants everywhere. On the other hand, that idea was a harbinger of joy, of cheer, of hope to the millions. The pioneers knew the difficulties in their way. They knew the opposition, the persecution, the hardships that would meet them. But proud and unafraid, they started on their march onward, ever onward. Now that idea has become a popular slogan. Almost everyone is a socialist today the rich man as well as his poor victim, the upholders of law and authority, as well as their unfortunate culprits, the free thinker, as well as the perpetuator of religious falsehoods, the fashionable lady, as well as the shirt-waist girl. Why not? Now that the truth of fifty years ago has become a lie, now that it has been clipped by all of its youthful imagination, and has been robbed of its vigor, its strength, its revolutionary ideal, why not? Now that it is no longer a beautiful vision, but a practical, workable scheme, resting on the will of the majority, why not? With the same political cunning and shrewdness, the mass is petted, pampered, cheated daily. Its praise is being sung in many keys, the poor majority, the outraged, the abused, the giant majority, if only it would follow us. Who has not heard this litany before? Who does not know this never-varying refrain of all politicians? That the mass bleeds, that it is being robbed and exploited, I know as well as our vote-baiters. But I insist that not the handful of parasites, but the mass itself is responsible for this horrible state of affairs. It clings to its masters, loves the whip, and is the first to cry, Crucify, the moment a protesting voice is raised against the sacredness of capitalistic authority or any other decayed institution. Yet how long would authority and private property exist, if not for the willingness of the mass to become soldiers, policemen, jailers, and hangmen? The socialist demagogues know that as well as I, but they maintain the myth of the virtues of the majority, because their very scheme of life means the perpetuation of power. And how could the latter be acquired without numbers? Yes power, authority, coercion, and dependence rest on the mass. But never freedom, never the free unfoldment of the individual, never the birth of a free society. Not because I do not feel with the oppressed, the disinherited of the earth. 
not because I do not know the shame, the horror, the indignity of the lives the people lead, do I repudiate the majority as a creative force for good. Oh, no, no! but because I know so well that as a compact mass it has never stood for justice or equality. It has suppressed the human voice, subdued the human spirit, chained the human body. As a mass its aim has always been to make life uniform, gray, and monotonous as the desert. As a mass it will always be the annihilator of individuality of free initiative, of originality. I therefore believe with Emerson that the masses are crude, lame, pernicious in their demands and influence, and need not to be flattered, but to be schooled. I wish not to concede anything to them, but to drill, divide, and break them up, and draw individuals out of them. Masses! The calamity are the masses! I do not wish any mass at all, but honest men only, lovely, sweet, accomplished women only. In other words, the living, vital truth of social and economic well-being will become a reality only through the zeal, courage, the non-compromising determination of intelligent minorities, and not through the mass. End of Minorities vs. Majorities by Emma Goldman A Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie van Wallichem A Modest Proposal For Preventing the Children of Poor People in Ireland for being a burden on their parents or country, and for making them beneficial to the public. By Jonathan Swift It is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town, or travel in the country, when they see the streets, the roads, and cabin doors, crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children, all in rags, and importuning every passenger for an alms. These mothers— instead of being able to work for their honest livelihood, are forced to employ all their time in strolling to back sustenance for their helpless infants, who, as they grow up, either turn thieves for want of work, or leave their dear native country to fight for the pretender in Spain, or sell themselves to the Barbados. I think it is agreed by all parties that this prodigious number of children in the arms or on the backs or at the heels of their mothers, and frequently of their fathers, is in the present deplorable state of the kingdom a very great additional grievance, and therefore whoever could find out a fair, cheap, and easy method of making these children sound and useful members of the commonwealth would deserve so well of the public as to have a statue set up for a preserver of the nation. But my intention is very far from being confined to provide only for the children of professed beggars. It is of a much greater extent, and shall take in the whole number of infants at a certain age, who are born of parents, in effect as little able to support them, as those who demand our charity in the streets. As to my own part, having turned my thoughts for many years upon this important subject, and maturely weighed the several schemes of our projectors, I have always found them grossly mistaken in their computation. It is true, a child just dropped from its dam may be supported by her milk for a sole a year with little other nourishment, at most not above the value of two shillings, which the mother may certainly get, of the value in scraps, by her lawful occupation of begging. And it is exactly at one year old that I propose to provide for them in such a manner as, instead of being a charge upon their parents or the parish, or wanting food and raiment for the rest of their lives, they shall, on the contrary, contribute to the feeding and partly to the clothing of many thousands. There is likewise another great advantage in my scheme, that it will prevent those voluntary abortions, and that horrid practice of women murdering the bastard children, 
alas, so frequent among us, sacrificing the poor innocent babes, I doubt, more to avoid the expense than the shame, which would move tears and pity in the most savage and inhuman breast. The number of souls in this kingdom being usually reckoned one million and a half, of these I calculate there may be about two hundred thousand couple whose wives are breeders, from which number I subtract thirty thousand couple who are able to maintain their own children, although I apprehend they cannot be so many under the present distresses of the kingdom, but this being granted, they will remain a hundred and seventy thousand breeders. I again subtract fifty thousand for those women who miscarry, or whose children die by accident or disease within the year. There only remain a hundred and twenty thousand children of poor parents annually born. The question, therefore, is, how this number shall be reared and provided for, which, as I have already said, under the present situation of affairs, is utterly impossible by all the methods hitherto proposed for we can neither employ them in handicraft or agriculture, we neither build houses, I mean in the country, nor cultivate land. They can very seldom pick up a livelihood by stealing, till they arrive at six years old, except where they are of towardly parts, although, I confess, they learn the rudiments much earlier, during which time they can, however, be properly looked upon only as probationers as I have been informed by a principal gentleman in the county of Caven, who protested to me that he never knew above one or two instances under the age of six, even in a part of the kingdom so renowned for the quickest proficiency in that art. I am assured by our merchants that a boy or a girl before twelve years old is no saleable commodity, and even when they come to this age, they will not yield above three pounds, or three pounds and half a crown at most, on the exchange, which cannot turn to account either to the parent or kingdom, the charge of nutriment and rags having been at least four times that value. I shall now, therefore, humbly propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London, that a young healthy child, well nursed, is, at a year old, a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or a ragout. I do therefore humbly offer it to public consideration, that of the hundred and twenty thousand children already computed, twenty thousand may be reserved for breed, whereof only one-fourth part should be males, which is more than we allow to sheep, black cattle, or swine. And my reason is, that these children are seldom the fruit of marriage, a circumstance not much regarded by our savages, therefore one male will be sufficient to serve four females. That the remaining hundred thousand may, at a year old, be offered in sale to the persons of quality and fortune through the kingdom, always advising the mother, to let them suck plentifully in the last month, so as to render them plump and fat for a good table. A child will make two dishes at an entertainment for friends, and when the family dines alone, the fore or hind quarter will make a reasonable dish, and seasoned with a little pepper or salt, will be very good boiled on the fourth day, especially in winter. I have reckoned upon a medium that a child just born will weigh twelve pounds, and in a solar year, if tolerably nursed, increaseth to twenty-eight pounds. I grant this food will be somewhat dear, and therefore very proper for landlords, who, as they have already devoured most of the parents, seem to have the best title to the children. Infant's flesh will be in season throughout the year, but more plentiful in March, and a little before and after, for we are told by a grave author, an eminent French physician, that fish being a prolific diet, there are more children born in Roman Catholic countries about nine months after Lent. The markets will be more glutted than usual, because the number of Popish infants is at least three to one in this kingdom, and therefore it will have one other collateral advantage, by lessening the number of papists among us. I have already computed the charge of nursing a beggar's child, in which list 
I reckon, all cottagers, labourers, and four-fifths of the farmers, to be about two shillings per annum, rags included, and I believe no gentleman would repine to give ten shillings for the carcass of a good fat child, which, as I have said, will make four dishes of excellent nutritive meat, when he hath only some particular friend or his own family to dine with him. Thus the squire will learn to be a good landlord, and grow popular among his tenants. The mother will have eight shillings neat profit, and be fit for work till she produces another child. Those who are more thrifty, as I must confess the times require, may flee the carcass, the skin of which, artificially dressed, will make admirable gloves for ladies and summer boots for fine gentlemen. As in our own city of Dublin, shambles may be appointed for this purpose in the most convenient parts of it, and butchers, we may be assured, will not be wanting, although I rather recommend buying the children alive and dressing them hot from the knife as we do roasting pigs. A very worthy person, a true lover of his country, and whose virtues I highly esteem, was lately pleased in discoursing on this matter to offer a refinement upon my scheme. He said that many gentlemen of this kingdom, having of late destroyed their deer, he conceived that the want of venison might be well supplied by the bodies of young lads and maidens not exceeding fourteen years of age, nor under twelve, so great a number of both sexes in every country being now ready to starve for want of work and service, and these to be disposed of by their parents if alive, or otherwise by their nearest relations but with due deference to so excellent a friend and so deserving a patriot i cannot be altogether in his sentiments for as to the males my american acquaintance assured me from frequent experience that their flesh was generally tough and lean like that of our schoolboys by continual exercise and their taste disagreeable and to fatten them would not answer the charge then as to the females it would i think with humble submission be a loss to the public because they soon would become breeders of themselves, and besides, it is not improbable that some scrupulous people might be apt to censure such a practice, although indeed very unjustly, as a little bordering upon cruelty, which, I confess, hath always been with me the strongest objection against any project, how elsewhere intended. But in order to justify my friend, he confessed that this expedient was put into his head by the famous Omaneza, a native of the island Formosa, who came from thence to London above twenty years ago, and in conversation told my friend that in his country, when any young person happened to be put to death, the executioner sold the carcass to persons of quality as a prime dainty, and that, in his time, the body of a plum girl of fifteen, who was crucified for an attempt to poison the emperor, was sold to his imperial majesty's prime minister of state and other great mandarins of the court in joints from the gibbet at four hundred crowns neither indeed can i deny that if the same use were made of several plump young girls in this town who without one single grow to their fortunes cannot stir abroad without a chair and appear at a playhouse and assemblies and foreign fineries which they never will pay for the kingdom would not be the worse some persons of a desponding spirit are in great concern about that vast number of poor people who are aged, deceased, or maimed, and I have been desired to employ my thoughts, what course may be taken, to ease a nation of so grievous an encumbrance. But I am not in the least pain upon that matter, because it is very well known that they are every day dying and rotting by cold and famine and filth and vermin as fast as can be reasonably expected and as to the young labourers they are now in almost as hopeful a condition they cannot get work and consequently pine away from want of nourishment to a degree that if at any time they are accidentally hired to common labour they have not strength to perform it and thus the country and themselves are happily delivered from the evils to come i have too long digressed and therefore shall return to my subject i think the advantages by the proposal which i have made are obvious and many as well as of the highest importance 
for first, as I have already observed, it would greatly lessen the number of papists, with whom we are yearly overrun, being the principal breeders of the nation, as well as our most dangerous enemies, and who stay at home on purpose, with a design to deliver the kingdom to the pretender, hoping to take their advantage by the absence of so many good Protestants, who have chosen rather to leave the country, than stay at home and pay tithes against their conscience to an Episcopal curate. Secondly, the poorer tenants will have something valuable of their own, which by law may be made liable to a distress, and help to pay the landlord's rent, their corn and cattle being already seized, and money a thing unknown. Thirdly, whereas the maintenance of a hundred thousand children, from two years old and upwards, cannot be computed to less than ten shillings apiece per annum, the nation's stock will be thereby increased, fifty thousand pounds per annum, besides the profit of a new dish introduced to the tables of all gentlemen of fortune in the kingdom who have any refinement in taste, and the money will circulate among ourselves, the goods being entirely of our own growth and manufacture. Fourthly, the constant breeders, besides a gain of eight shillings sterling per annum by the sale of their children, will be rid of the charge of maintaining them after first year. Fifthly, this food would likewise bring great custom to taverns, where the vintners will certainly be so prudent as to procure the best receipts for dressing it to perfection, and consequently have their houses frequented by all the fine gentlemen who justly value themselves upon their knowledge in good eating, and a skilful cook who understands how to oblige his guests will contrive to make it as expensive as they please. Sixthly, this would be a great inducement to marriage, which all wise nations have either encouraged by rewards, or enforced by laws and penalties. It would increase the care and tenderness of mothers towards their children, when they were sure of a settlement for life to the poor babes, provided in some sort by the public, to their annual profit instead of expense. We should soon see an honest emulation among the married women, which of them could bring the fattest child to the market. Men would become as fond of their wives during the time of their pregnancy, as they are now of their mares and foal, their cows and calf, or so when they are ready to farrow, nor offer to beat or kick them, as is too frequent a practice, for fear of a miscarriage. Many other advantages might be enumerated. For instance, the addition of some thousand carcasses in our exportation of belled beef, the propagation of swine's flesh, and improvement in the art of making good bacon, so much wanted among us by the great destruction of pigs too frequent at our tables, which are no way comparable in taste or magnificence to a well-grown fat yearly child, which, roasted hull, will make a considerable figure at a lord's major's feast, or any other public entertainment. But this, and many others, I admit, being studious of brevity. Supposing that one thousand families in the city would be constant customers for infants' flesh, besides others who might have it at merry meetings, particularly at weddings and christenings, I compute that Dublin would take off annually about twenty thousand carcasses, and the rest of the kingdom, where probably they will be sold somewhat cheaper, the remaining eighty thousand. I can think of no one objection that will possibly be raised against this proposal, unless it should be urged, that the number of people will be thereby much lessened in the kingdom. This I freely own, and was indeed one principal design in offering it to the world. I desire the reader will observe, that I calculate my remedy for this one individual kingdom of Ireland, and for no other that ever was, is, or I think ever can be, upon earth. Therefore, let no man talk to me of other expedients, of taxing our absentees at five shillings a pound, of using neither clothes nor household furniture, except what is of our own growth and manufacture, of utterly rejecting the materials and instruments that promote foreign luxury, of curing the expensiveness of pride, vanity, idleness, and gaming in our women, of introducing a vein of parsimony, prudence, and temperance, of learning to love our country, wherein we differ even from Laplanders and the inhabitants of Tepanambu, of quitting our animosities and factions, 
nor acting any longer like the Jews, who were murdering one another at the very moment the city was taken, of being a little cautious not to sell our country and consciences for nothing, of teaching landlords to have at least one degree of mercy towards their tenants, lastly, of putting a spirit of honesty, industry, and skill into our shopkeepers, who, if a resolution could now be taken to buy only our native goods, would immediately unite to cheat and exact upon us in the price, the measure, and the goodness, nor could have yet be brought to make one fair proposal of just dealing, though often and earnestly invited to it. Therefore I repeat, let no man talk to me of these and the like expedients, till he hath at least some glimpse of hope, that there will ever be some hearty and sincere attempt to put them into practice. But as to myself, having been wearied out for many years with offering vain, idle, visionary thoughts, and at length utterly despairing of success, I fortunately fell upon this proposal, which, as it is all in you, so it hath something solid and real, of no expense, a little trouble, full in our own power, and whereby we can incur no danger in disobliging England. For this kind of commodity will not bear exportation, and flesh being of too tender a consistence to admit a long continuance in salt, although perhaps I could name a country which would be glad to eat up our whole nation without it. After all, I am not so violently bent upon my own opinion as to reject any offer proposed by wise men which shall be found equally innocent cheap, easy, and effectual. But before something of that kind shall be advanced in contradiction to my scheme, and offering a better, I desire the author, or authors, will be pleased maturely to consider two points. First, as things now stand, how they will be able to find food and raiment for a hundred thousand useless mouths and backs. And secondly, there being a round million of creatures in human figure throughout this kingdom, whose whole subsistence put into a common stock, would leave them in debt two million of pounds sterling, adding those who are beggars by profession, to the bulk of farmers, cottagers, and labourers, with their wives and children, who are beggars in effect. I desire those politicians who dislike my overture, and may perhaps be so bold to attempt an answer, that they will first ask the parents of these mortals, whether they would not, at this day, think it a great happiness to have been sold for food at a year old, in the manner I prescribe, and thereby have avoided such a perpetual scene of misfortunes, as if they have since gone through, by the oppression of landlords, the impossibility of paying rent without money or trade, the want of common sustenance, with neither house nor clothes, to cover them from the inclemencies of the weather, and the most inevitable prospect of entailing the like or greater miseries upon their breed for ever. I profess, in the sincerity of my heart, that I have not the least personal interest in endeavouring to promote this necessary work, having no other motive than the public good of my country by advancing our trade, providing for infants, relieving the poor, and giving some pleasure to the rich. I have no children by which I can propose to get a single penny, the youngest being nine years old, and my wife past childbearing. End of A Mother's Proposal by Jonathan Swift Non-Censorship by Hayward Brown A censor is a man who has read about Joshua and forgotten Canute. He believes that he can hold back the mighty traffic of life with a tin whistle and a raised right hand. For, after all, it is life with which he quarrels. Censorship is seldom greatly concerned with truth. Propriety is its worry, and obviously impropriety was allowed to creep into the fundamental scheme of creation. It is perhaps a little unfortunate that no right-minded censor was present during the first week in which the world was made. The plan of sex, for instance, could have been suppressed effectively then, and Mr. Sumner might have been spared the dreadful and dangerous ordeal of reading Jurgen so many centuries later. Indeed, if there had only been right-minded supervision over the modelling of Adam and Eve, the world could worry along nicely without the aid of the Society for the Suppression of Vice, suppression of those biological facts 
which the society includes in its definition of vice is now impossible concealment is really what the good men are after somewhat after the manner of the babes in the woods they would cover us over with leaves for men and women they have figs and for babies they have cabbages it must have been a censor who first hit upon the notion that what you don't know won't hurt you we doubt whether it is a rule which applies to sex eve left eden and took upon herself a curse for the sake of knowledge it seems a little heedless of this heroism to advocate that we keep the curse and forget the knowledge the battle against censorship should have ended at the moment of the eating of the apple at that moment man committed himself to the decision that he would know all about life even though he died for it unfortunately under the terms of existence of mortals one decision is not enough we must keep reaffirming decisions if they are to hold even in eden there was the germ of a new threat to degrade adam and eve back to innocence when they ate the apple an amoeba in a distant corner of the garden shuddered and began the long and difficult process of evolution to all practical purposes john s sumner was already born to us the whole theory of censorship is immoral if its functions were administered by the wisest man in the world it would still be wrong but of course the wisest man in the world would have too much sense to be a censor we are not dealing with him his substitutes are distinctly lesser folk they are not even trained for their work except in the most haphazard manner obviously a censor should be the most profound of psychologists instead the important posts and the agencies of suppression go to the boy who can capture the largest number of smutty postcards after he has confiscated a few gross he is promoted to the task of watching over art by that time he has been pretty thoroughly blasted for the sins of the people an extraordinary number of things admit of shameful interpretations in his mind for instance the sight of a woman making baby clothes is not generally considered a vicious spectacle in many communities but it may not be shown on the screen in pennsylvania by order of the state board of censors in new york kipling's anne of austria was not allowed to take the wage of infamy and eat the bread of shame in a screen version of the ballad of fisher's boarding-house thereby a most immoral effect was created Anne was shown wandering about quite casually and drinking in conversation with sailors who were perfect strangers to her but the censors would not allow any stigma to be placed upon her conduct indeed this decision seems to support the rather strange theory that deeds don't matter so long as nothing is said about them the new york picture board is peculiarly sensitive to words upon one occasion a picture was submitted with the caption the air of the south seas breathes an erotic perfume cut out erotic came back the command of the censors in illinois charlie chaplin was not allowed to have a scene in the kid in which upon being asked the name of the child he shook his head and rushed into the house returning a moment later to answer bill that particular board of censors seemed intent upon keeping secret the fact that there are two sexes of course it may be argued that motion pictures are not an art and that it makes little difference what happens to them we cannot share that indifference enough has been done in pictures to convince us that very beautiful things might be achieved if only the censors could be put out of the way not all the silliness of the modern american picture is the fault of the producers much of the blame must rest with the various boards of censorship it is difficult to think up many stories in which there is no passion crime or birth as a matter of fact we are of the opinion that the entire theory of motion picture censorship is mistaken the guardians of morals hold that if the spectator sees a picture of a man robbing a safe he will thereby be moved to rob a safe himself in rebuttal we offer the testimony of a gentleman much wiser in the knowledge of human conduct than any censor writing in the new republic george bernard shaw advocated that hereafter public reading-rooms 
supplied their patrons only with books about evil characters for he argued after reading about evil deeds our longings for wickedness are satisfied vicariously on the other hand there is the danger that the public may read about saints and heroes and drain off its aspirations in such directions without actions we believe this is true we once saw a picture about a highwayman that was in the days before censorship was as strict as it is now and it convinced us that the profession would not suit us we had not realized the amount of compulsory riding entailed the particular highwayman whom we saw dined hurriedly slept infrequently and invariably had his boots on mostly he was being pursued and hurtling over hedges it left us sore in every muscle to watch him at the end of the eighth reel every bit of longing in our soul to be a swashbuckler had abated the man in the picture had done the adventuring for us and we could return in comfort to a peaceful existence florid literature is the compensation for humdrummery if we are ever completely shut off from a chance to see or read about a little evil doing we shall probably be moved to go out and cut loose on our own so far we have not felt the necessity we have been willing to let d'artagnan do it even so arduous an abstinence as prohibition may be made endurable through fictional substitutes after listening to a drinking chorus in a comic opera and watching the amusing antics of the chief comedian who is ever so inebriated we are almost persuaded to stay dry prohibition is perhaps the climax of censorship it has the advantage over other forms of suppression in that at least it represents a sensible point of view yet we are not converted there are things in the world far more important than hard sense one of the officials of the anti-saloon league gave out a statement the other day in which he endeavoured to show all the benefits provided by prohibition but he did it with figures there was a column showing the increase of accounts in savings banks and another devoted to the decrease of inmates in hospitals, jails, and almshouses. From a utilitarian point of view, the figures, if correct, could hardly fail to be impressive. But little has been said by either side about the spiritual effects of rum. Unfortunately, there are no statistics on that, and yet it is the one phase of the question which interests us. Some weeks ago we happened to observe a letter from a man who wrote to one of the newspapers protesting against the proposed settlement in ireland on the ground that it's so damned sensible we have somewhat the same feeling about prohibition it is a movement to take the folly out of our national life and there is no quality which america needs so sorely if enforcement ever becomes perfect this will be a nation composed entirely of men who wear rubbers put money in the bank and go to bed at ten that fine old ringing phrase this is on me will be gone from the language conversation will be wholly instructive for in fifty years the last generation capable of saying do you remember that night will have been gathered to its fathers of course there is no denying the short-sightedness of the forces of rum they cannot escape their responsibility for having aided in the advent of prohibition they were slow to see the necessity of some form of curtailment and limitation of the traffic such moves as they did make were entirely wrong-headed for instance we had ordinances providing for the early closing of cafes instead of that we should have had laws forbidding anybody to sell liquor except between the hours of eight p m and five a m daytime drinking was always sodden but something is necessary to make night worth while man is more than the beasts and he should not be driven into dull slumber just because the sun has set the invention of electricity liquor cut glass mirrors and cards made man the master of his environment rather than its slave now that liquor is gone all the other factors are mockery card playing has become merely an extension of the cruel and logical process of the survival of the fittest the fellow with the best hand wins instead of the one with the best head nobody draws four cards any more or stands for a raise on an inside straight the thing is just cut-throat and scientific and wholly mercenary 
the kitty is gone nobody cares to come in to a common fund for the purchase of mineral water and cheese sandwiches and with the passing of the kitty the most promising development of cooperation and communism in america has gone it was prophetic of a more perfectly organized society in the days of the kitty the fine socialistic ideal of from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs was made specific and workable and the inspiring romantic tradition of robin hood was also carried over into modern life the kitty robbed only the rich and left the poor alone but now none of us will contribute unquestionably to the material comfort of others each must keep his money for the savings bank perhaps something of the old friendly rivalry may be revived in a hundred years it may be that men will meet around a table and that one will say to the other what have you got i've got nine thousand eight hundred and seventy six dollars and thirty two cents in first mortgages and gilt-edged securities that's good you win but somehow or other we doubt it another mistake which was made in the policy of compromising with the dries was the agreement that liquor should not be served to miners on the contrary the provision should have been that drink ought not to be permitted to any man more than thirty years of age liquor was never meant to be a steady companion it was the animating influence which made oats wild work and responsibility are the portion of the mature man rum was designed for youthful days when the reckless avidity for experience is so great that reality must be blurred a little lest it blind us we happened to pick up a copy of the harvard crimson the other day and read the first freshman smoker will be held at seven forty five o'clock this evening in the living room of the union p h theopold twenty five chairman of the smoker committee will act as chairman including clark hodder twenty five and j h child twenty five the class president and secretary respectively after the speeches there will be a motion picture and some vaudeville by a magician from keith ginger ale crackers and cigarettes will be served all freshmen are invited to attend they used to be called freshman beer nights and in those days the possibility of friendship at first sight was not fantastic we feel sure that it cannot be done on ginger ale the urge for democracy does not dwell in any soft drink the speeches will be terrible for there will be no pleasant interruptions of ah sit down from the man in the back of the room if somebody begins to sing p h theopold is a good old soul it is not likely to carry conviction not once during the evening will any speaker confine himself to saying to hell with yale and falling off the table probably the magician will not be able to find anything in the high hat except white rabbits although we have seen no first-hand report of that freshman smoker we feel sure that it was only a crowded self-conscious gathering of a number of young men who said little and went home early even from the standpoint of the strictest of abstainers there must be some regret for the passing of rum what man who lived through the bad old days does not remember the thrill of rectitude which came to him the first time he said make mine a cigar though they have taken away our rum from us we have our memories not all the days have been dull gray back in the early pages of our diary is the entry about the trip which we made to boston with william f in the hard winter of nineteen o seven it was agreed that neither of us should drink the same sort of drink twice staunch william achieved nineteen varieties but we topped him with twenty-four upon examination we observed that the entry in the memory book was made several days later the handwriting is a little shaky but for that adventure we might have lived and died entirely ignorant of the nature of an angel float in those days human sympathy was wider f m w seemed in many respects a matter-of-fact man but it was he who chanced upon the fifty-ninth street circle just before dawn and paused to call the attention of all the bystanders to the statue of columbus look at him he said christopher columbus he discovered america and then they sent him back to spain in chains he wept and we realized for the first time that under a rough exterior there beat a heart of gold on the art of fiction 
by Willer Sabert Cather. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Art of Fiction One is sometimes asked about the obstacles that confront young writers who are trying to do good work. I should say the greatest obstacles that writers today have to get over are the dazzling journalistic successes of twenty years ago, stories that surprised and delighted by their sharp photographic detail, and that were really nothing more than lively pieces of reporting. The whole aim of that school of writing was novelty, never a very important thing in art. They gave us altogether poor standards, taught us to multiply our ideas instead of to condense them. They tried to make a story out of every theme that occurred to them, and to get returns on every situation that suggested itself. They got returns of a kind. But their work, when one looks back on it, now that the novelty upon which they counted so much is gone, is journalistic and thin. The especial merit of a good reportorial story is that it shall be intensely interesting and pertinent to-day, and shall have lost its point by to-morrow. Art, it seems to me, should simplify. That, indeed, is very nearly the whole of the higher artistic process. Finding what conventions of form and what detail one can do without, and yet preserve the spirit of the whole, so that all that one has suppressed and cut away is there to the reader's consciousness as much as if it were in type on the page. Millet has done hundreds of sketches of peasants sowing grain, some of them very complicated and interesting, but when he came to paint the spirit of them all into one picture, the sower, the composition is so simple that it seems inevitable. All the discarded sketches that went before made the picture what it finally became, and the process was all the time one of simplifying, of sacrificing many conceptions good in themselves for one that was better and more universal. Any first-rate novel or story must have in it the strength of a dozen fairly good stories that have been sacrificed to it. A good workman can't be a cheap workman, he can't be stingy about wasting material, and he can't compromise. Writing ought either to be the manufacture of stories for which there is a market demand, a business as safe and commendable as making soap or breakfast foods, or it should be an art, which is always a search for something for which there is no market demand, something new and untried, where the values are intrinsic, and have nothing to do with standardized values. The courage to go on without compromise does not come to a writer all at once, nor, for that matter, does the ability. Both are phases of natural development. In the beginning the artist, like his public, is wedded to old forms, old ideals, and his vision is blurred by the memory of old delights he would like to recapture. From the Borzoi, 1920 End of On the Art of Fiction by Willa Siebert Cather The Expunging Resolutions by Henry Clay This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. U.S. Senate, January 16th, 1837 Mr. President, what patriotic purpose is to be accomplished by this expunging resolution? What new honor or fresh laurels will it win for our common country? Is the power of the Senate so vast that it ought to be circumscribed, and that of the President so restricted that it ought to be extended? What power has the Senate? None separately. It can only act jointly with the other house, or jointly with the executive. And although the theory of the Constitution supposes, when consulted by him, it may freely give an affirmative or negative response according to the practice, as it now exists, it has lost the faculty of pronouncing the negative monosyllable. When the Senate expresses its deliberate judgment in the form of resolution, that resolution has no compulsory force, but appeals only to the dispassionate intelligence, the calm reason, and sober judgment of the community. The Senate has no army, no navy, no patronage, no lucrative offices, no glittering honors to bestow. Around us there is no swarm of greedy expectants, rendering us homage, anticipating our wishes, and ready to execute our commands. 
how is it with the president? Is he powerless? He is felt from one extremity to the other of this vast republic. By means of principles which he has introduced, and innovations which he has made in our institutions, alas, but too much countenanced by Congress, and a confiding people, he exercises uncontrolled the power of the state. In one hand he holds the purse, and in the other brandishes the sword of the country. Myriads of dependents and partisans, scattered over the land, are ever ready to sing hosannas to him, and to laud the skies whatever he does. He has swept over the government during the last eight years like a tropical tornado. Every department exhibits traces of the ravages of the storm. Take as one example the Bank of the United States. No institution could have been more popular with the people, with Congress, and with state legislatures. None ever better fulfilled the great purposes of its establishment. But it unfortunately incurred the displeasure of the president. He spoke, and the bank lies prostrate. And those who were loudest in its praise are now loudest in its condemnation. What object of his ambition is unsatisfied? When disabled from age any longer to hold the scepter of power, he designates his successor and transmits it to his favorite. What more does he want? Must we blot, deface, and mutilate the records of the country to punish the presumptuousness of expressing an opinion contrary to his own? What patriotic purpose is to be accomplished by this expunging resolution? Can you make that not to be which has been? Can you eradicate from memory and from history the fact that in March 1834, a majority of the Senate of the United States passed the resolution which excites your enmity? Is it your vain and wicked object to arrogate to yourselves that power of annihilating the past which has been denied to omnipotence itself? Do you intend to thrust your hand into our hearts and to pluck out the deeply rooted convictions which are there? Or is it your design merely to stigmatize us? You cannot stigmatize us. Ne'er yet did base dishonor blur our name. Standing securely upon our conscious rectitude and bearing aloft the shield of the constitution of our country, your puny efforts are impotent and we defy all your power. Put the majority of 1834 in one scale, and that by which this expunging resolution is to be carried in the other, and let truth and justice in heaven above and on earth below, and liberty and patriotism decide the preponderance. What patriotic purpose is to be accomplished by the expunging resolution? Is it to appease the wrath and to heal the wounded pride of the chief magistrate? If he be really the hero that his friends represent him, he must despise all mean condescension, all groveling sycophany, and all self-degradation and self-abasement. He would reject, with scorn and contempt, as unworthy of his fame, your black scratches and your baby lines in the fair records of his country. Black lines! Black lines. Sir, I hope the Secretary of the Senate will preserve the pen with which he may inscribe them, and present it to that Senator of the Majority whom he may select as a proud trophy to be transmitted to his descendants. And hereafter, when we shall lose the forms of our free institutions, all that now remains to us, some future American monarch, and gratitude to those by whose means he has been enabled, upon the ruins of civil liberty, to erect a throne, and to commemorate especially this expunging resolution, may institute a new order of knighthood, and confer on it the appropriate name of the Knights of the Black Lines. But why should I detain the Senate, or needlessly waste my breath in fruitless exertions, the decree has gone forth. It is one of urgency, too. The deed is to be done. 
That foul deed which, like the blood staining the hands of the guilty Macbeth, all ocean's waters will never wash out. Proceed, then, to the noble work which lies before you, and, like other skillful executioners, do it quickly. And when you have perpetrated it, go home to the people, and tell them what glorious honors you have achieved for our common country. Tell them that you have extinguished one of the brightest and purest lights that ever burned the altar of civil liberty. Tell them that you have silenced one of the noblest batteries that ever thundered in defense of the Constitution and bravely spiked the cannon. Tell them that, henceforward, no matter what daring or outrageous act any president may perform, you have forever hermetically sealed the mouth of the Senate. Tell them that he may fearlessly assume what powers he pleases, snatch from its lawful custody the public purse, command a military detachment to enter the halls of the Capitol, overawe Congress, trample down the Constitution, and raise every bulwark of freedom, but that the Senate must stand mute, in silent submission, and not dare to raise its opposing voice. Tell them that it must wait until a House of Representatives, humbled and subdued like itself, and a majority of it, composed of the partisans of the President, shall prefer articles of impeachment. Tell them, finally, that you have restored the glorious doctrine of passive obedience and non-resistance, and, if the people do not pour out their indignation and imprecations, I have yet to learn the character of American freemen. End of On the Expunging Resolutions by Henry Clay Read On the Fear of Death by William Hazlitt Read by Arthur Berger This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Fear of Death Our little life is rounded with the sleep. Perhaps the best cure for the fear of death is to reflect that life has a beginning as well as an end. There was a time when we were not. This gives us no concern. Why, then, should it trouble us that a time will come when we shall cease to be? I have no wish to have been alive a hundred years ago, or in the reign of Queen Anne. Why should I regret and lay it so much to heart that I shall not be alive a hundred years hence in the reign of I cannot tell whom? When Bickerstaff wrote his essays, I knew nothing of the subjects of them. Nay, much later and but the other day, as it were, in the beginning of the reign of George III, when Goldsmith, Johnson, Burke, used to meet at the Globe, when Garrick was in his glory, and Reynolds was over head and ears with his portraits, and Stern brought out the volumes of Tristram Shandy year by year, it was without consulting me. I had not the slightest intimation of what was going on. The debates in the House of Commons on the American War, or the firing at Bunker's Hill, disturbed not me. Yet I thought this no evil. I neither ate, drank, nor was merry, yet I did not complain. I had not then looked out into this breathing world, yet I was well and the world did quite as well without me as I did without it. Why then should I make all this outcry about parting with it, and being no worse off than I was before? There is nothing in the recollection that at a certain time we were not come into the world that the gorge rises at. Why should we revolt at the idea that we must one day go out of it? To die is only to be as we were before we were born, yet no one feels any remorse or regret or repugnance in contemplating this last idea. It is rather a relief and disburdening of the mind. 
It seems to have been holiday time with us then. We were not called to appear upon the stage of life, to wear robes or tatters, to laugh or cry, be hooted or applauded. We had lain produce all this while, snug, out of harm's way, and had slept out our thousands of centuries without wanting to be waked up, at peace and free from care, in a long non-age, in a sleep deeper and calmer than that of infancy, wrapped in the softest and finest dust. And the worst that we dread is, after a short, fretful, feverish being, after vain hopes and idle fears, to sink to final repose again, and forget the troubled dream of life. Ye armed men, knights templars, that sleep in the stone aisles of that old temple church, where all is silent above, and where a deeper silence reigns below, not broken by the pealing organ, are ye not contented where you lie? Or would you come out of your long homes to go to the holy war? Or do you complain that pain no longer visits you, that sickness has done its worst, that you have paid the last debt to nature, that you hear no more of the thickening phalanx of the foe, or your lady's waning love, and that while this ball of earth rolls its eternal round, no sound shall ever pierce through to disturb your lasting repose? fixed as the marble over your tombs, breathless as the grave that holds you. And thou, O thou to whom my heart turns, and will turn while it has feeling left, who didst love in vain, and whose first was thy last sigh, wilt not thou too rest in peace? Or wilt thou cry to me complaining from thy clay-cold bed, when that sad heart is no longer sad, and that sorrow is dead, which thou wert only called into the world to feel. It is certain that there is nothing in the idea of a pre-existent state that excites our longing, like the prospect of a posthumous existence. We are satisfied to have begun life when we did. We have no ambition to have set out on our journey sooner, and feel that we have had quite enough to do to battle our way through since. We cannot say, the wars we well remember of King Nine, of old Asarachus and Inachus divine. Neither have we any wish. We are contented to read of them in story, and to stand and gaze at the vast sea of time that separates us from them. It was early days then, the world was not well aired enough for us. We have no inclination to have been up and stirring. We do not consider the six thousand years of the world before we were born as so much time lost to us. We are perfectly indifferent about the matter. We do not grieve and lament that we did not happen to be in time to see the grand mask and pageant of human life going on in all that period, though we are mortified at being obliged to quit our stand before the rest of the procession passes. It may be suggested, in explanation of this difference, that we know from various records and traditions what happened in the time of Queen Anne, or even in the reigns of the Assyrian monarchs, but that we have no means of ascertaining what is to happen hereafter but by awaiting the event, and that our eagerness and curiosity are sharpened in proportion as we are in the dark about it. This is not at all the case, for at that rate we should be constantly wishing to make a voyage of discovery to Greenland or to the moon, neither of which we have in general the least desire to do. Neither, in truth, have we any particular solicitude to pry into the secrets of futurity, but as a pretext for prolonging our own existence. It is not so much that we care to be alive a hundred or a thousand years hence, any more than to have been alive a hundred or a thousand years ago. But the thing lies here, that we would all of us wish the present moment to last forever. We would be as we are, 
and but have the world remain just as it is to please us. The present eye catches the present object, to have and to hold while it may, and abhors on any terms to have it torn from us, and nothing left in its room. It is the pang of parting, the unloosing our grasp, the breaking asunder some strong tie, the leaving some cherished purpose unfulfilled, that creates the repugnance to go, and makes calamity of so long life, as it often is. O thou strong heart, there's such a covenant twixt the world and thee, they're loath to break. The love of life, then, is an habitual attachment, not an abstract principle. Simply to be does not content man's natural desire. We long to be in a certain time, place, and circumstance. We would much rather be now, on this bank and shoal of time, than have our choice of any future period, than take a slice of fifty or sixty years out of the millennium, for instance. This shows that our attachment is not confined either to being or to well-being, but that we have an inveterate prejudice in favor of our immediate existence, such as it is. The mountaineer will not leave his rock, nor the savage's hut. Neither are we willing to give up our present mode of life, with all its advantages and disadvantages, for any other that could be substituted for it. No man would, I think, exchange his existence with any other man, however fortunate. We had as lief not be, as not be ourselves. There are some persons of that reach of soul that they would like to live two hundred and fifty years hence, to see what height of empire America will have grown up in that period, or whether the English Constitution will last so long. These are points beyond me. But I confess I should like to live to see the downfall of the Bourbons. That is a vital question with me, and I shall like it the better the sooner it happens. No young man ever thinks he shall die. He may believe that others will, or assent to the doctrine that all men are mortal, as an abstract proposition. But he is far enough from bringing it home to himself individually. Youth, buoyant activity, and animal spirits hold absolute antipathy with old age as well as with death. Nor have we in the heyday of life any more than in the thoughtlessness of childhood the remotest conception how this sensible, warm motion can become a kneaded clod, nor how sanguine, florid health and vigor shall turn to withered, weak, and gray. Or, if in a moment of idle speculation we indulge in this notion of the close of life as a theory, it is amazing at what a distance it seems, what a long, leisurely interval there is between, what a contrast its slow and solemn approach affords to our present gay dreams of existence. We eye the farthest verge of the horizon, and think what a way we shall have to look back upon ere we arrive at our journey's end. And without our in the least suspecting it, the mists are at our feet, and the shadows of age encompass us. The two divisions of our lives have melted into each other. The extreme points close and meet with none of that romantic interval stretching out between them that we had reckoned upon. And for the rich, melancholy, solemn hues of age, the seer, the yellow leaf, the deepening shadows of an autumnal evening, we only feel a dank, cold mist encircling all objects after the spirit of youth is fled. There is no inducement to look forward, and what is worse, little interest in looking back to what has become so trite and common. The pleasures of our existence have worn themselves out, and are gone into the wastes of time, or have turned their indifferent side to us. The pains, by their repeated blows, have worn us out, and have left us neither spirit nor inclination to encounter them again 
in retrospect. We do not want to rip out old grievances, nor to renew our youth like the phoenix, nor to live our lives twice over. Once is enough. As the tree falls, so let it lie. Shut up the book and close the account once and for all. It has been thought by some that life is like the exploring of a passage that grows narrower and darker the farther we advance, without a possibility of ever turning back, and where we are stifled for want of breath at last. For myself, I do not complain of the greater thickness of the atmosphere as I approach the narrow house. I felt it more formally when the idea alone seemed to suppress a thousand rising hopes and weighed upon the pulses of the blood. At present, I rather feel the thinness and want of support. I stretch out my hand to some object and find none. I am too much in a world of abstraction. The naked map of life is spread out before me, and in the emptiness and desolation I see death coming to meet me. In my youth I could not behold him for the crowd of objects and feelings, and hope stood always between us, saying, Never mind that old fellow. If I had lived indeed, I should not care to die. But I do not like a contract of pleasure broken off, unfulfilled, a marriage with joy, unconsummated, a promise of happiness, rescinded. My public and private hopes have been left a ruin, or remain only to mock me. I would wish them to be re-edified. I should like to see some prospect of good to mankind, such as my life began with. I should like to leave some sterling work behind me. I should like to have some friendly hand to consign me to the grave. On these conditions, I am ready, if not willing, to depart. I shall then write upon my tomb, grateful and contented. But I have thought and suffered too much to be willing to have thought and suffered in vain. In looking back, it sometimes appears to me as if I had in a manner slept out my life in a dream or shadow on the side of a hill of knowledge where I have fed on books, on thoughts, on pictures, and only heard in half-murmurs the trampling of busy feet or the noises of the throng below. Waked out of this dim twilight existence, I have felt a wish to descend to the world of realities and join in the chase, but I fear too late, and that I had better return to my bookish chimeras and indolence once more. It is not wonderful that the contemplation and fear of death have become more familiar to us as we approach nearer to it, that life seems to ebb with the decay of blood and youthful spirits, and that as we find everything about us subject to chance and change, as our strength and beauty die, as our hopes and passions, our friends and our affections leave us, we begin by degrees to feel ourselves mortal. I have never seen death but once, and that was in an infant. It is years ago. The look was calm and placid, and the face was fair and firm. It was as if a waxen image had been laid out in the coffin and strewed with innocent flowers. It was not like death, but more like an image of life. No breath moved the lips, no pulse stirred, no sight or sound would enter those eyes or ears more. While I looked at it, I saw no pain was there. It seemed to smile at the short pang of life which was over. But I could not bear the coffin lid be closed. It seemed to stifle me, and still, as a nettle's wave in a corner of the churchyard over his little grave, the welcome breeze helps to refresh me and ease the tightness of my breast. An ivory or marble image, like Chantre's monument of the two children, is contemplated with pure delight. Why do we not grieve and fret that the marble is not alive, 
or fancy that it has a shortness of breath. It never was alive, and it is the difficulty of making the transition from life to death, the struggle between the two in our imagination, that confounds their properties painfully together, and makes us conceive that the infant that is but just dead still wants to breathe, to enjoy, and look about it, and is prevented by the icy hand of death, locking up its faculties and benumbing its senses, so that if it could, it would complain of its own hard state. Perhaps religious considerations reconcile the mind to this change sooner than any others, by representing the spirit as fled to another sphere, and leaving the body behind it. So, in reflecting on death generally, we mix up the idea of life with it, and thus make it the ghastly monster it is. We think how we should feel, not how the dead feel. Still from the tomb the voice of nature cries, even in our ashes live their wanted fires. There is an admirable passage on this subject in Tucker's Light of Nature Pursued, which I shall transcribe, as by much the best illustration I can offer of it. The melancholy appearance of a lifeless body, the mansion provided for it to inhabit, dark, cold, close, and solitary, are shocking to the imagination. But it is to the imagination only, not the understanding. For whoever consults his faculty will see at first glance that there is nothing dismal in all of these circumstances. If the corpse were kept wrapped in a warm bed, with a roasting fire in the chamber, it would feel no comfortable warmth therefrom. Were store of tapers lighted up as soon as day shuts in, it would see no objects to divert it. Were it left at large, it would have no liberty, nor if surrounded with company, would be cheered thereby. Neither are the distorted features expressions of pain, uneasiness, or distress. This everyone knows, and will readily allow upon being suggested, yet still cannot behold, nor even cast a thought upon those objects without shuddering. For knowing that a living person must suffer grievously under such appearances, they become habitually formidable to the mind, and strike a mechanical horror, which is increased by the customs of the world around us. There is usually one pang, added voluntarily and unnecessarily to the fear of death, by our affecting to compassionate the loss which others will have in us. If that were all, we might reasonably set our minds to rest. The pathetic exhortation on country tombstones, Grieve not for me, my wife and children dear, etc., is for the most part speedily followed to the letter. We do not leave so great a void in society as we are inclined to imagine, partly to magnify our own importance and partly to console ourselves by sympathy. Even in the same family, the gap is not so great. The wound closes up sooner than we should expect. Nay, our room is not infrequently thought better than our company. People walk along the streets the day after our deaths, just as they did before, and the crowd is not diminished. While we were living, the world seemed in a manner to exist only for us, but our delight and amusement, because it contributed to them. But our hearts cease to beat, and it goes on as usual, and thinks no more about us than it did in our lifetime. The million are devoid of sentiment and care, as little for you or for me as if we belong to the moon. We we'll live the week over in the Sunday's paper, or are decently interred in some obituary at the month's end. It is not surprising that we are forgotten so soon after we quit this mortal stage. We are scarcely noticed while we are on it. It is not merely that our names are not known in China. They have hardly been heard of in the next street. 
We are hand in glove with the universe and think the obligation is mutual. This is an evident fallacy. If this, however, does not trouble us now, it will not hereafter. A handful of dust can have no quarrel to pick with its neighbors or complaint to make against providence, and might well exclaim, if it had but an understanding in a tongue, Go thy ways, old world, swing round in blue ether, voluble to every age, you and I shall no more jostle. It is amazing how soon the rich and titled, even some of those who have wielded great political power, are forgotten. A little rule, a little sway, is all the great and mighty have betwixt the cradle and the grave. And after its short date, they hardly leave a name behind them. A great man's memory may, at the common rate, survive him half a year. His heirs and successors take his titles, his power and his wealth, all that made him considerable or courted by others, and he has left nothing else behind him either to delight or benefit the world. Posterity are not by any means so disinterested as they are supposed to be. They give their gratitude and admiration only in return for benefits conferred. They cherish the memory of those to whom they are indebted for instruction and delight, and they cherish it just in proportion to the instruction and delight they are conscious they receive. The sentiment of admiration springs immediately from this ground, and cannot be otherwise than well-founded. The effeminate clinging to life as such, as a general or abstract idea, is the effect of a highly civilized and artificial state of society. Men, formerly plunged into all the vicissitudes and dangers of war, or staked their all upon a single die, or some one passion, which, if they could not have gratified, life became a burden to them. Now our strongest passion is to think, our chief amusement is to read new plays, new poems, new novels, and this we may do at our leisure, in perfect security, ad infinitum. If we look into the old histories and romances, before the belle lettre neutralized human affairs and reduced passion to a state of mental equivocation, we find the heroes and heroines not setting their lives at a pin's fee, but rather courting opportunities of throwing them away in a very wantonness of spirit. They raise their fondness for some favorite pursuit to its height, to a pitch of madness, and then think no price too dear to pay for its full gratification. Everything else is dross. They go to death as to a bridal bed, and sacrifice themselves or others without remorse at the thrine of love, of honor, of religion, or any other prevailing feeling. Romeo runs his seasick, weary bark upon the rocks of death the instant he finds himself deprived of his Juliet, and she clasps his neck in their last agonies and follows him to the same fatal shore. One strong idea takes possession of the mind and overrules every other. And even life itself, joyless without that, becomes an object of indifference or loathing. There is at least more of imagination in such a state of things, more vigor of feeling and promptitude to act, than in our lingering, languid, protracted attachment to life for its own poor sake. It is perhaps also better, as well as more heroical, to strike at some daring or darling object, and if we fail in that, to take the consequences manfully, than to renew the lease of a tedious, spiritless, charmless existence, merely, as Pierre says, to lose it afterwards in some vile brawl for some worthless object. Was there not a spirit of martyrdom, as well as a spice of the reckless energy of barbarism, in this bold defiance of death? Had not religion something to do with it? The implicit belief in a future life, which rendered this of less value, 
and embodied something beyond it to the imagination, so that the rough soldier, the infatuated lover, the valorous knight, etc., could afford to throw away the present venture and take a leap into the arms of futurity, which the modern skeptic sinks back from, with all his boasted reason and vain philosophy, weaker than a woman. I cannot help thinking so myself, but I have endeavored to explain this point before, and will not enlarge farther on it here. A life of action and danger moderates the dread of death. It not only gives us fortitude to bear pain, but teaches us at every step the precarious tenure on which we hold our present being. Sedentary and studious men are the most apprehensive on this score. Dr. Johnson was an instance in point. A few years seemed to him soon over compared with those sweeping contemplations on time and infinity with which he had been used to pose himself. In the still life of a man of letters, there was no obvious reason for a change. He might sit in an armchair and pour out cups of tea to all eternity. Would it had been possible for him to do so? The most rational cure after all for the inordinate fear of death is to set a just value on life. If we merely wish to continue on the scene to indulge our headstrong humors and tormenting passions, we had better be gone at once. And if we only cherish a fondness for existence according to the good we derive from it, the pang at parting with it will not be very severe. End of On the Fear of Death by William Hazlitt Letter on the Slave Trade This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Todd Cutler Letter on the Slave Trade by Benjamin Franklin Published under the pseudonym Historicus On the Slave Trade To the Editor of the Federal Gazette March 23, 1790 Sir, Reading last night in your excellent paper the speech of Mr. Jackson in Congress against their meddling with the affair of slavery, or attempting to mend the condition of the slaves, it put me in mind of a similar one, made about one hundred years since, by Sidi Mehemet Ibrahim, a member of the Divan of Algiers, which may be seen in Martin's account of his consulship, anno 1687. It was against granting the petition of the sect called Erica, or Purist, who prayed for the abolition of piracy and slavery as being unjust. Mr. Jackson does not quote it, perhaps he has not seen it. If, therefore, some of its reasonings are to be found in his eloquent speech, it may only show that men's interests and intellects operate, and are operated on, with surprising similarity in all countries and climates, when under similar circumstances. The African speech, as translated, is as follows. Allah, Bismillah, et etc. God is great, and Muhammad is his prophet. Have these Erika considered the consequences of granting their petition? If we cease our cruises against the Christians, how shall we be furnished with the commodities their countries produce, and which are so necessary for us? If we forbear to make slaves of their people, who in this hot climate are to cultivate our lands? Who are to perform the common labors of our city, and in our families? Must we not then be our own slaves? And is there not more compassion and more favor due to us as Mussulmen than to these Christian dogs? We have now about fifty thousand slaves in and near Algiers. This number, if not kept up by fresh supplies, will soon diminish and be gradually annihilated. If we then cease taking and plundering the infidel ships, and making slaves of the seamen and passengers, our lands will become of no value for want of cultivation. The rents of houses in the city will sink one half, and the revenues of government arising from its share of prizes be totally destroyed. And for what? 
to gratify the whims of a whimsical sect who would have us not only forbear making more slaves but even to manumit those we have but who is to indemnify their masters for their loss will the state do it is our treasury sufficient will the erica do it can they do it or would they to do what they think justice to the slaves do greater injustice to the owners and if we set our slaves free what is to be done with them few of them will return to their countries they know too well the hardships they must there be subject to they will not embrace our holy religion they will not adopt our manners our people will not pollute themselves by intermarrying with them must we maintain them as beggars in our streets or suffer our properties to be the prey of their pillage for men long accustomed to slavery will not work for a livelihood when not compelled and what is there so pitiable in their present condition were they not slaves in their own countries are not spain portugal france and the italian states governed by despots who hold all their subjects in slavery without exception even england treats its sailors as slaves for they are whenever the government pleases seized and confined in ships of war condemned not only to work but to fight for small wages or a mere substance not better than our slaves are allowed by us is their condition then made worse by falling into our hands no they have only exchanged one slavery for another and i may say a better for here they are brought into a land where the sun of islamism gives forth its light and shines in full splendor and they have an opportunity of making themselves acquainted with the true doctrine and thereby saving their immortal souls those who would remain at home have not that happiness sending the slaves home then would be sending them out of light into darkness i repeat the question what is to be done with them i have heard it suggested that they may be planted in the wilderness where there is plenty of land for them to subsist on and where they may flourish as a free state but they are i doubt too little disposed to labor without compulsion as well as too ignorant to establish a good government and the wild arabs would soon molest and destroy or again enslave them while serving us we take care to provide them with everything and they are treated with humanity the laborers in their own country are as i am well informed worse fed lodged and clothed the condition of most of them is therefore already mended and requires no further improvement here their lives are in safety they are not liable to be impressed for soldiers or forced to cut one another's christian throats as in the war of their own countries if some of the religious mad bigots who now tease us with their silly petitions have in a fit of blind zeal freed their slaves it was not generosity it was not humanity that moved them to the action it was from the conscious burden of a load of sins and hope from the supposed merits of so good a work to be excused damnation how grossly they are mistaken in imagining slavery to be disallowed by the al Quran! are not the two precepts to quote no more masters treat your slaves with kindness slaves serve your masters with cheerfulness and fidelity clear proofs to the contrary nor can the plundering of infidels be in that sacred book forbidden since it is well known from it that god has given the world and all that it contains to his faithful mussulmen who are to enjoy it of right as fast as they conquer it let us then hear no more of this detestable proposition the manumission of christian slaves the adoption of which would by depreciating our lands and houses and thereby depriving so many good citizens of their properties create universal discontent and provoke insurrections to the endangering of government and producing general confusion i have therefore no doubt but this wise counsel will prefer the comfort and happiness of a whole nation of true believers to the whim of a few erica and dismiss their petition the result was as martin tells us that the divan came to this resolution the doctrine that plundering and enslaving the christians is unjust is at best problematic but that it is the interest of this state to continue the practice is clear therefore let the petition be rejected and it was rejected accordingly and since like motives are apt to produce in the minds of men like opinions and resolutions may we not mr brown venture to predict from this account that the petitions to the parliament of england for abolishing the slave trade to say nothing of other legislatures and the debates upon them will have a similar conclusion i am sir your constant reader and humble servant historicus 
on the tendency of varieties to depart indefinitely from the original type by alfred russell wallace this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by anna simon one of the strongest arguments which have been adduced to prove the original and permanent distinctness of species is that varieties produced in a state of domesticity are more or less unstable and often have a tendency if left to themselves to return to the normal form of the parent species and this instability is considered to be a distinctive peculiarity of all varieties even of those occurring among wild animals in a state of nature and to constitute a provision for preserving unchanged the originally created distinct species in the absence of scarcity of facts and observations as to varieties occurring among wild animals this argument has had great weight with naturalists and has led to a very general and somewhat prejudiced belief in the stability of species equally general however is the belief in what are called permanent or true varieties races of animals which continually propagate their like but which differ so slightly although constantly from some other race that the one is considered to be a variety of the other which is the variety and which the original species there is generally no means of determining except in those rare cases in which the one race has been known to produce an offspring unlike itself and resembling the other this however would seem quite incompatible with the permanent invariability of species but the difficulty is overcome by assuming that such varieties have strict limits and can never again vary further from the original type although they may return to it which from the analogy of the domesticated animals is considered to be highly probable if not certainly proved it will be observed that this argument rests entirely on the assumption that varieties occurring in a state of nature are in all respects analogous to or even identical with those of domestic animals and are governed by the same laws as regards their permanence or further variation but it is the object of the present paper to show that this assumption is altogether false that there is a general principle in nature which will cause many varieties to survive the parent species and to give rise to successive variations departing further and further from the original type and which also produces in domesticated animals the tendencies of varieties to return to the parent form the life of wild animals is a struggle for existence the full exertion of all their faculties and all their energies is required to preserve their own existence and provide for that of their infant offspring the possibility of procuring food during the least favourable seasons and of escaping the attacks of their most dangerous enemies are the primary conditions which determine the existence both of individuals and of entire species these conditions will also determine the population of a species and by a careful consideration of all the circumstances we may be enabled to comprehend and in some degree to explain what at first sight appears so inexplicable the excessive abundance of some species while others closely allied to them are very rare the general proportion that must obtain between certain groups of animals is readily seen large animals cannot be so abundant as small ones the carnivora must be less numerous than the herbivora eagles and lions can never be so plentiful as pigeons and antelopes the wild asses of the tartarian deserts cannot equal in numbers the horses of the more luxuriant prairies and pampas of america the greater or less fecundity of an animal is often considered to be one of the chief causes of its abundance or scarcity but a consideration of the facts will show us that it really has little or nothing to do with the matter even the least prolific of animals would increase rapidly if unchecked whereas it is evident that the animal population of the globe must be stationary or perhaps through the influence of man decreasing fluctuations there may be but permanent increase except in restricted localities is almost impossible for example our own observation must convince us that birds do not go on increasing every year in a geometrical ratio as they would do were there not some powerful check to their natural increase very few birds produce less than two young ones each year while many have six eight or ten four will certainly be below the average and if we suppose that each pair produce young only four times in their life that will also be below the average supposing them not to die either by violence or want of food yet at this rate how tremendous would be the increase in a few years from a single pair a simple calculation will show that in fifteen years each pair of birds would have increased to nearly ten millions 
whereas we have no reason to believe that the number of the birds of any country increases at all in fifteen or in one hundred and fifty years. With such powers of increase, the population must have reached its limits and have become stationary in a very few years after the origin of each species. It is evident, therefore, that each year an immense number of birds must perish, as many, in fact, as are born, and as on the lowest calculation the progeny are each year twice as numerous as their parents, it follows that, whatever be the average number of individuals existing in any given country, twice that number must perish annually. A striking result, but one which seems at least highly probable, and is perhaps under rather than over the truth. It would therefore appear that, as far as the continuance of the species and the keeping up the average number of individuals are concerned, large broods are superfluous. On the average, all above one become food for hawks and kites, wild cats and weasels, or perish of cold and hunger as winter comes on. This is strikingly proved by the case of particular species, for we find that their abundance in individuals bears no relation whatever to their fertility in producing offspring. Perhaps the most remarkable instance of an immense bird population is that of the passenger pigeon of the United States, which lays only one, or at most two eggs, and is said to rear generally but one young one. Why is this bird so extraordinarily abundant, while others producing two or three times as many young are much less plentiful? The explanation is not difficult. The food most congenial to this species, and on which it thrives best, is abundantly distributed over a very extensive region, offering such differences of soil and climate, that in one part or another of the area the supply never fails. The bird is capable of a very rapid and long-continued flight, so that it can pass without fatigue over the whole of the district it inhabits, and as soon as the supply of food begins to fail in one place is able to discover a fresh feeding ground. This example strikingly shows us that the procuring a constant supply of wholesome food is almost the sole condition requisite for ensuring the rapid increase of a given species, since neither the limited fecundity nor the unrestrained attacks of birds of prey and of man are here sufficient to check it. In no other birds are these peculiar circumstances so strikingly combined. Either their food is more liable to failure, or they have not sufficient power of wing to search for it over an extensive area, or during some season of the year it becomes very scarce, and less wholesome substitutes have to be found. And thus, though more fertile in offspring, they can never increase beyond the supply of food in the least favourable seasons. Many birds can only exist by migrating, when their food becomes scarce, to regions possessing a milder, or at least a different climate though, as these migrating birds are seldom excessively abundant, it is evident that the countries they visit are still deficient in a constant and abundant supply of wholesome food. Those whose organization does not permit them to migrate when their food becomes periodically scarce can never attain a large population. This is probably the reason why woodpeckers are scarce with us, while in the tropics they are among the most abundant of solitary birds. Thus the house sparrow is more abundant than the redbreast because its food is more constant and plentiful, seeds of grasses being preserved during the winter, and our farmyards and stubble fields furnishing an almost inexhaustible supply. Why, as a general rule, are aquatic, and especially sea birds, very numerous in individuals? Not because they are more prolific than others, generally the contrary, but because their food never fails, the seashores and river banks daily swarming with a fresh supply of small mollusca and crustacea. Exactly the same law will apply to mammals. Wild cats are prolific and have few enemies. Why, then, are they never as abundant as rabbits? The only intelligible answer is that their supply of food is more precarious. It appears evident, therefore, that so long as a country remains physically unchanged, the numbers of its animal population cannot materially increase. If one species does so, some others requiring the same kind of food must diminish in proportion. The numbers that die annually must be immense, and as the individual existence of each animal depends upon itself, those that die must be the weakest, the very young, the aged, and the diseased, while those that prolong their existence can only be the most perfect in health and vigour, those who are best able to obtain food regularly and avoid their numerous enemies. It is, as we commenced by remarking, a struggle for existence in which the weakest and least perfectly organized must always succumb. 
Now, it is clear that what takes place among the individuals of a species must also occur among the several allied species of a group, that is, that those which are best adapted to obtain a regular supply of food and to defend themselves against the attacks of their enemies and the vicissitudes of the seasons, must necessarily obtain and preserve a superiority in population, while those species which from some defect of power or organization are the least capable of counteracting the vicissitudes of food, supply, etc., must diminish in numbers, and, in extreme cases, become altogether extinct. Between these extremes the species will present various degrees of capacity for ensuring the means of preserving life, and it is thus we account for the abundance or rarity of species. Our ignorance will generally prevent us from accurately tracing the effects to their causes, but could we become perfectly acquainted with the organization and habits of the various species of animals, and could we measure the capacity of each for performing the different acts necessary to its safety and existence, under all the varying circumstances by which it is surrounded, we might be able even to calculate the proportionate abundance of individuals which is the necessary result. If now we have succeeded in establishing these two points, first, that the animal population of a country is generally stationary, being kept down by a periodical deficiency of food and other checks, and second, that the comparative abundance or scarcity of the individuals of the several species is entirely due to their organization and resulting habits which, rendering it more difficult to procure a regular supply of food and to provide for their personal safety in some cases than in others, can only be balanced by a difference in the population, which have to exist in a given area, we shall be in a condition to proceed to the consideration of varieties to which the preceding remarks have a direct and very important application. Most, or perhaps all, the variations from the typical form of a species must have some definite effect, however slight, on the habits or capacities of the individuals. Even a change of colour might, by rendering them more or less distinguishable, affect their safety. A greater or less development of hair might modify their habits. More important changes, such as an increase in the power or dimensions of the limbs or any of the external organs, would more or less affect their mode of procuring food or the range of country which they inhabit. It is also evident that most changes would affect, either favourably or adversely, the powers of prolonging existence. An antelope with shorter or weaker legs must necessarily suffer more from the attacks of the feline carnivora. The passenger pigeon, with less powerful wings, would sooner or later be affected in its powers of procuring a regular supply of food, and in both cases the result must necessarily be a diminution of the population of the modified species. If, on the other hand, any species should produce a variety having slightly increased powers of preserving existence, that variety must inevitably in time acquire a superiority in numbers. These results must follow as surely as old age, intemperance, or scarcity of food produce an increased mortality. In both cases there may be many individual exceptions, but on the average the rule will invariably be found to hold good. All varieties will therefore fall into two classes, those which under the same conditions would never reach the population of the parent species, and those which would in time obtain and keep a numerical superiority. Now let some alteration of physical conditions occur in the district. A long period of drought, a destruction of vegetation by locusts, the eruption of some new carnivorous animal seeking pastures new any change in fact tending to render existence more difficult to the species in question, and tasking its utmost powers to avoid complete extermination. It is evident that, of all the individuals composing the species, those forming the least numerous and most feebly organized variety would suffer first, and, where the pressure severe, must soon become extinct. The same causes continuing in action, the parent species would next suffer would gradually diminish in numbers, and with a recurrence of similar unfavourable conditions might also become extinct. The superior variety would then alone remain, and on a return to favourable circumstances would rapidly increase in numbers and occupy the place of the extinct species and variety. The variety would now have replaced the species of which it would be a more perfectly developed and more highly organised form. It would be in all respects better adapted to secure its safety and to prolong its individual existence and that of the race. Such a variety could not return to the original form, for that form is an inferior one, and could never compete with it for existence. 
granted, therefore, a tendency to reproduce the original type of the species, still the variety must ever remain preponderant in numbers, and under adverse physical conditions again alone survive. But this new, improved, and populous race might itself, in course of time, give rise to new varieties, exhibiting several diverging modifications of form, any of which, tending to increase the facilities for preserving existence, must, by the same general law, in their turn become predominant. Here, then, we have progression and continued divergence deduced from the general laws which regulate the existence of animals in a state of nature, and from the undisputed fact that varieties do frequently occur. It is not, however, contended that this result would be invariable. A change of physical conditions in the district might at times materially modify it, rendering the race which had been the most capable of supporting existence under the former conditions now the least so, and even causing the extinction of the newer and for a time superior race, while the old or parent species and its first inferior varieties continued to flourish. Variations in unimportant parts might also occur, having no perceptible effect on the life-preserving powers, and the varieties so furnished might run a course parallel with the parent species, either giving rise to further variations or returning to the former type. All we argue for is that certain varieties have a tendency to maintain their existence longer than the original species, and this tendency must make itself felt. For though the doctrine of chances or averages can never be trusted on a limited scale, yet, if applied to high numbers, the results come nearer to what theory demands, and as we approach to an infinity of examples, become strictly accurate. Now the scale on which nature works is so vast, the numbers of individuals and periods of time with which she deals approach so near to infinity, that any cause, however slight, and however liable to be veiled and counteracted by accidental circumstances, must in the end produce its full legitimate results. Let us now turn to domesticated animals, and inquire how varieties produced among them are affected by the principles here enunciated. The essential difference in the condition of wild and domestic animals is this, that among the former their well-being and very existence depend upon the full exercise and healthy condition of all their senses and physical powers, whereas among the latter these are only partially exercised, and in some cases are absolutely unused. A wild animal has to search, and often to labour, for every mouthful of food, to exercise sight, hearing, and smell in seeking it, and in avoiding dangers, in procuring shelter from the inclemency of the seasons, and in providing for the subsistence and safety of its offspring. There is no muscle of its body that is not called into daily and hourly activity. There is no sense or faculty that is not strengthened by continual exercise. The domestic animal, on the other hand, has food provided for it is sheltered and often confined to guard it against the vicissitudes of the seasons, is carefully secured from the attacks of its natural enemies, and seldom even rears its young without human assistance. Half of its senses and faculties are quite useless, and even the other half are but occasionally called into feeble exercise, while even its muscular system is only irregularly called into action. Now, when a variety of such an animal occurs, having increased power or capacity in any organ or sense, such increase is totally useless, is never called into action, and may even exist without the animal ever becoming aware of it. In the wild animal, on the contrary, all its faculties and powers being brought into full action for the necessities of existence, any increase becomes immediately available, is strengthened by exercise, and must even slightly modify the food, the habits, and the whole economy of the race. It creates, as it were, a new animal, one of superior powers, and which will necessarily increase in numbers and outlive those inferior to it. Again, in the domesticated animal, all variations have an equal chance of continuance, and those which would decidedly render a wild animal unable to compete with its fellows and continue its existence are no disadvantage whatever in a state of domesticity. Our quickly fattening pigs, short-legged sheep, Pouter pigeons and poodle dogs could never have come into existence in a state of nature, because the very first step towards such inferior forms would have led to the rapid extinction of the race. Still less could they now exist in competition with our wild allies. The great speed but slight endurance of the racehorse, the unwieldy strength of the ploughman's team, would both be useless in a state of nature. 
If turned wild on the pampas, such animals would probably soon become extinct, or, under favourable circumstances, might each lose those extreme qualities which would never be called into action, and in a few generations would revert to a common type, which must be that in which the various powers and faculties are so proportioned to each other as to be best adapted to procure food and secure safety that in which by the full exercise of every part of his organization the animal can alone continue to live domestic varieties when turned wild must return to something near the type of the original wild stock or become altogether extinct we see then that no inferences as to varieties in a state of nature can be deduced from the observation of those occurring among domestic animals the two are so much opposed to each other in every circumstance of their existence that what applies to the one is almost sure not to apply to the other. Domestic animals are abnormal, irregular, artificial. They are subject to varieties which never occur and never can occur in a state of nature. Their very existence depends altogether on human care. So far are many of them removed from that just proportion of faculties, that true balance of organization, by means of which alone an animal left to its own resources can preserve its existence and continue its race. The hypothesis of Lamarck, that progressive changes in species have been produced by the attempts of animals to increase the development of their own organs, and thus modify their structure and habits, has been repeatedly and easily refuted by all writers on the subject of varieties and species, and it seems to have been considered that when this was done the whole question has been finally settled. But the view here developed renders such an hypothesis quite unnecessary by showing that similar results must be produced by the action of principles constantly at work in nature. The powerful retractile talons of the falcon and the cat tribes have not been produced or increased by the volition of those animals, but among the different varieties which occurred in the earlier and less highly organized forms of these groups, those always survived longest which had the greatest facilities for seizing their prey. Neither did the giraffe acquire its long neck by desiring to reach the foliage of the more lofty shrubs and constantly stretching its neck for the purpose, but because any varieties which occurred among its antitypes, with a longer neck than usual, at once secured a fresh range of pasture over the same ground as the shorter-necked companions, and on the first scarcely of food were thereby enabled to outlive them. Even the peculiar colours of many animals, especially insects, so closely resembling the soil or the leaves of or the trunks on which they habitually reside, are explained on the same principle. For though in the course of ages varieties of many tints may have occurred, yet those races having colours best adapted to concealment from their enemies would inevitably survive the longest. We have also here an acting cause to account for that balance so often observed in nature, a deficiency in one set of organs always being compensated by an increased development of some others powerful wings accompanying weak feet, or great velocity making up for the absence of defensive weapons, for it has been shown that all varieties in which an unbalanced deficiency occurred could not long continue their existence. The action of this principle is exactly like that of the centrifugal governor of the steam-engine, which checks and corrects any irregularities almost before they become evident and in like manner no unbalanced deficiency in the animal kingdom can ever reach any conspicuous magnitude, because it would make itself felt at the very first step, by rendering existence difficult and extinction almost sure soon to follow. An origin such as is here advocated will also agree with the peculiar character of the modifications of form and structure which obtain in organized beings, the many lines of divergence from a central type, the increasing efficiency and power of a particular organ through a succession of allied species, and the remarkable persistence of unimportant parts such as colour, texture of plumage and hair, form of horns or crests, through a series of species differing considerably in more essential characters. It also furnishes us with a reason for that more specialised structure which Professor Owen states to be a characteristic of recent compared with extinct forms and which would evidently be the result of the progressive modification of any organ applied to a special purpose in the animal economy. We believe we have now shown that there is a tendency in nature to the continued progression of certain classes of varieties further and further from the original type, a progression to which there appears no reason to assign any definite limits, 
and that the same principle which produces this result in a state of nature will also explain why domestic varieties have a tendency to revert to the original type. This progression by minute steps in various directions, but always checked and balanced by the necessary conditions, subject to which alone existence can be preserved, may, it is believed, be followed out so as to agree with all the phenomena presented by organized beings, their extinction and succession in past ages, and all the extraordinary modifications of form, instinct, and habits which they exhibit. Ternat, February 1858 End of On the Tendency of Varieties to Depart Indefinitely from the Original Type by Alfred Russell Wallace This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. On the Tragedies of Shakespeare by Charles Lamb This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie von Wallichem on the tragedies of Shakespeare, considered with a reference to their fitness for stage representation, by Charles Lamb. Taking a turn the other day in the Abbey, I was struck with the affected attitude of a figure which I do not remember to have seen before, and which, upon examination, proved to be a whole length of the celebrated Miss Garrick. So I would not go so far with some good Catholics abroad as to shut plays altogether out of consecrated ground, yet I own I was not a little scandalized at the introduction of theatrical airs and gestures into a play set apart to remind us of the saddest realities. Going nearer, I found inscribed under this harlequin figure the following lines, To paint fair nature by divine command, a magic pencil in his glowing hand, a Shakespeare rose, then to expand his fame wide o'er this breathing world a garret came though sunk in death the forms the poet drew the actor's genius bade them breathe anew so like the bard himself in night they lay immortal garret called them back to day until eternity with power sublime shall mark the mortal hour of hoary time Shakespeare and Garrick, like twin stars, shall shine, and earth irradiate with a beam divine. It would be an insult to my readers' understandings to attempt anything like a criticism on this farrago of false thoughts and nonsense, but the reflection it let me into was a kind of wonder how, from the days of the actor here celebrated to our own, it should have been the fashion to compliment every performer in his turn that has luck to please the town in any of the great characters of Shakespeare, with the notion of possessing a mind congenial with the poet. How people should come thus unaccountably to confound the power of originating poetical images and conceptions with the faculty of being able to read or recite the same when put into words, nor to author, it is observable that we fall into this confusion only in dramatic recitations. We never dream that a gentleman who reads Lucretius in public with great applause is therefore a great poet and philosopher. Nor do you find that Tom Davis, the bookseller, who is recorded to have recited The Paradise Lost better than any man in England in his day, though I cannot help thinking there must be some mistake in this tradition, was therefore by his intimate friends set upon a level with Milton, and of Orsa's note. Or what connection, that absolute mastery of the heart and soul of man, which a great dramatic poet possesses, has with those low tricks upon the eye and ear, which a player, by observing a few general effects, which some common passion, as grief, anger, etc., usually has upon the gestures and exterior, can so easily compass. 
to know the eternal workings and movements of a great mind of an othello or a hamlet for instance the when and the why and how far they should be moved to what pitch a passion is becoming to get the reins and to pull in the curb exactly at the moment when the drawing in or the slacking is most graceful seems to demand the reach of intellect of a vastly different extent from that which is employed upon the bare imitation of the signs of these passions in countenance or gesture which signs are usually observed to be most lively and emphatic in the weaker sort of minds and which signs can after all but indicate some passion as i said before anger or grief generally but of the motives and grounds of the passion wherein it differs from the same passion in low and vulgar natures of these the actor can give no more idea by his face or gesture than the eye without a metaphor can speak or the muscles utter intelligibly sounds but such is the instantaneous nature of the impressions which we take in of the eye and ear at a playhouse compared with the slow apprehension oftentimes of the understanding in reading that we are wrapped not only to sing the play-writer in the consideration which we pay to the actor but even to identify in our minds in a perverse manner the actor with the character which he represents it is difficult for a frequent play-goer to disembarrass the idea of hamlet from the person and voice of mr k we speak of lady macbeth while we are in reality thinking of mrs s nor is this confusion incidental alone to unlettered persons who not possessing the advantage of reading are necessarily dependent upon the stage player for all the pleasure which they can receive from the drama and to whom the very idea of what an author is cannot be made comprehensible without some pain and perplexity of mind the error is one from which persons otherwise not merely lettered find it almost impossible to extricate themselves never let me be so ungrateful as to forget the very high degree of satisfaction which i received some years back from seeing for the first time a tragedy of shakespeare performed in which of these two great performers sustained the principal parts it seemed to embody and realize conceptions which had hitherto assumed no distinct shape but dearly do we pay all our life after for this juvenile pleasure the sense of distinctness when the novelty is past we find to our cost that instead of realizing an idea we have only materialized and brought down a fine vision to the standard of flesh and blood we have let go a dream in quest of an unattainable substance how cruelly this operates upon the mind to have its free conceptions thus cramped and pressed down to the measure of a straight lacing actuality may be judged from the delightful sensation of freshness with which we turn to those plays of shakespeare which have escaped being performed and to those passages in the acting plays of the same writer which have happily been left out in performance how far the very custom of hearing anything spouted withers and blows upon a fine passage may be seen in those speeches from henry v etc which are current in the mouths of schoolboys from their being to be found in enfield speakers and such kind of books i confess myself utterly unable to appreciate that celebrated soliloquy in hamlet beginning to be or not to be or to tell whether it be good bad or indifferent it has been so handled and poured about by declamatory boys and men torn so inhumanly from its living place and principle of continuity in the play till it has become to me a perfect dead member it may seem a paradox but i cannot help being of opinion that the plays of shakespeare are less calculated for performance on the stage than those of almost any other dramatist whatever their distinguished excellence is a reason that they should be so there is so much in them which comes not under the province of acting with which eye and tone and gesture have nothing to do the glory of the scenic art is to personate passion and the turns of passion and the more coarse and palpable the passion is the more hold upon the eyes and ears of the spectators the performer obviously possesses for this reason scalding scenes scenes where two persons talk themselves into a fit of fury and then in a surprising manner talk themselves out of it again have always been the most popular upon our stage 
and the reason is plain because the spectators are here most palpably appealed to they are the proper judges in this war of words they are the legitimate ring that should be formed round such intellectual prize-fighters talking is a direct object of the imitation here but in all the best dramas and in shakespeare above all how obvious it is that the forms of speaking whether it be in soliloquy or dialogue is only a medium and often a highly artificial one for putting the reader or spectator into possession of that knowledge of the inner structure and workings of mind in the character which he could otherwise never have arrived at in that form of composition by any gift short of intuition we do here as we do with novels written in the epistolary form how many improprieties perfect solecisms in letter-writing do we put up with in clarissa and other books for the sake of the delight which that form upon the whole gives us but the practice of stage representation reduces everything to controversy of elocution every character from the boisterous blasphemings of bazet to the shrinking timidity of womanhood must play the orator the love dialogues of romeo and juliet those silver-sweet sounds of lovers tongues by night the more intimate and sacred sweetness of nuptial colloquy between an othello or a posthumus with their married wives all those delicacies which are so delightful in the reading as when we read of those youthful dalliances in paradise as beseemed fair couple linked in happy nuptial league alone by the inherent fault of stage representation how are these things sullied and turned from their very nature by being exposed to a large assembly when such a speech is as imogen addresses to a lord come drawling out of the mouth of a hired actress whose courtship though nominally addressed to the personated posthumous is manifestly aimed at the spectators who are to judge of her endearments and her returns of love the character of hamlet is perhaps that by which since the days of batcherton a succession of popular performers have had the greatest ambition to distinguish themselves the length of the part may be one of their reasons but for the character itself we find it in a play and therefore we judge it a fit subject of dramatic representation the play itself abounds in maxims and reflections beyond any other and therefore we consider it as a proper vehicle for conveying moral instruction but hamlet himself what does he suffer meanwhile by being dragged forth as a public schoolmaster to give lectures to the crowd why nine parts in ten of what hamlet does are transactions between himself and his moral sense they are the effusions of his solitary musings which he retires to holes and corners in the most sequestered parts of the palace to pour forth or rather they are the silent meditations with which his bosom is bursting reduced to words for the sake of the reader who must else remain ignorant of what is passing there these profound sorrows these light and nose boring ruminations which if the tongue scare dares utter to deaf walls and chambers how can they be represented by a gesticulating actor who comes and mounts them out before an audience making four hundred people his confidence at once i say not that it is the fault of the actor so to do he must pronounce them or a rotundo he must accompany them with his eye he must insinuate them into his auditory by some trick of eye tone or gesture or he fails he must be thinking all the while of his appearance because he knows that all the while the spectators are judging of it and this is a way to represent the shy negligent retiring hamlet it is true that there is no other mode of conveying a vast quantity of thought and feeling to a great portion of the audience who otherwise would never earn it for themselves by reading and the intellectual acquisition gained this way may for aught i know be inestimable but i am not arguing that hamlet should not be acted but how much hamlet is made another thing by being acted i have heard much of the wonders which garrick performed in this part but as i never saw him i must have leave to doubt whether the representation of such a character came within the province of his art those who tell me of him speak of his eye of the magic of his eye and of his commanding voice physical properties vastly desirable in an actor and without which he can never insinuate meaning into an auditory but what have they to do with hamlet 
what have they to do with intellect? In fact, the things aimed at in theatrical representation are to rest the spectator's eye upon the form and the gesture, and so to gain a more favourable hearing to what is spoken. It is not what the character is, but how he looks, not what he says, but how he speaks it. I see no reason to think that if the play of Hamlet were written over again by some such writer as Banks or Lillo, retaining the process of the story, but totally omitting all the poetry of it, all the divine features of Shakespeare, his stupendous intellect, and only taking care to give us enough of passion dialogue, which Banks or Lillo were never at a loss to furnish, I see not how the effect could be much different upon an audience, nor how the actor has it in his power to represent Shakespeare to us differently from his representation of Bangs or Lillo. Hamlet would still be a youthful, accomplished prince, and must be gracefully personated. He might be puzzled in his mind, wavering in his conduct, seemingly cruel to Ophelia. He might see ghost and start at it, and address it kindly when he found it to be his father. All this— in the poorest and most homely language of the servilest creep after nature that ever consulted the palate of an audience, without troubling Shakespeare for the matter, and I see not but there would be room for all the power which an actor has to display itself. All the passions and changes of passions might remain, for those are much less difficult to write or act than a sort. It is a trick easy to be attained. It is but rising or falling a note or two in the voice, a whisper, with a significant foreboding look to announce his approach, and so contagious the counterfeit appearance of any emotion is, that let the words be what they will, the look and tone shall carry it off, and make it pass for deep skill in the passions. It is common for people to talk of Shakespeare's play being so natural, that everybody can understand him. They are natural indeed. They are grounded deep in nature, so deep, that the death of them lies out of the reach of most of us. You shall hear the same person say that George Barnwell is very natural, and Othello is very natural, that they are both very deep, and to them they are the same kind of thing. At the one they sit and shed tears, because a good sort of young man is tempted by a naughty woman to commit a trifling peccadillo, the murder of an uncle or so, that is all, and so comes to an untimely end, which is so moving, and at the other, because a blackamoor in a fit of jealousy kills his innocent white wife, and the odds are that ninety-nine out of hundred would willingly behold the same catastrophe happen to both the heroes, and have thought the rope more due to Othello than to Barnwell. For of the texture of Othello's mind, the inward construction marvellously laid open with all its strengths and weaknesses, its heroic confidences and its human misgivings, its agonies of hate springing from the depths of love, they see no more than the spectators at a cheap rate, or pay their pennies apiece, to look through the man's telescope in Leicester fields, to see into the inward plot and topography of the moon. Some dim thing, or rather, they see, they see an actor personating a passion of grief or anger, for instance, and they recognize it as a copy of the hugely external effects of such passions, or at least as being true to that symbol of the emotion which passes current at the theatre for it, for it is often no more than that. But of the grounds of the passion, it corresponds to a great or heroic nature, which is the only worthy object of tragedy, that common auditors know anything of this, or can have any such notions dinned into them by the mere strength of an actor's lungs, that apprehensions foreign to them should be thus infused into them by storm, I can neither believe nor understand how it can be possible. We talk of Shakespeare's admirable observation of life, when we should feel that not from a petty inquisition into those cheap and everyday characters which surrounded him, as they surround us, but from his own mind which was, to borrow a phrase of Ben Jonson's, the very sphere of humanity, he fetched those images of virtue and of knowledge, of which every one of us, recognising a part, think we comprehend in our nature as a who, and oftentimes mistake the powers 
which she positively creates in us, for nothing more than indigenous faculties of her own minds, which only waited for the action of corresponding virtues in him to return a full and clear echo of the same. To return to Hamlet. Among the distinguishing features of that wonderful character, one of the most interesting yet painful, is a soreness of mind which makes him treat the intrusions of Polonius with harshness, and that asperity which he puts on in his interviews with Ophelia. These tokens of an unhinged mind, if they be not mixed in the latter case with the profound artifice of love, to alienate Ophelia by affected discourtesies, and to prepare her mind for the breaking off of that loving intercourse which can no longer find a place amidst business so serious as that which he has to do, a part of his character which, to reconcile with our admiration of Hamlet, the most patient consideration of his situation is no more than necessary. They are what we forgive afterwards, and explain by the whole of his character, but at the time they are harsh and unpleasant. Yet such is the actor's necessity of giving strong blows to the audience, that I have never seen a player in this character, who did not exaggerate and strain to the utmost these ambiguous features, these temporary deformities in the character. They make him express a vulgar scorn at Polonius, which utterly degrades his gentility, and which no explanation can render palatable. They make him show contempt and curl up the nose at Ophelia's father, contempt in its very grossest and most hateful form, but they get applause by it. It is natural, people say. That is, the words are scornful, and the actor expresses scorn, and that they can judge of. But why so much is scorn, and of that sort, they never think of asking? So to Ophelia, all the hamlets that I have ever seen rant and rave at her, as if she had committed some great crime, and the audience are highly pleased, because the words of the part are satirical, and they are enforced by the strongest expression of satirical indignation, of which the face and voice are capable. But then, with a Hamlet is likely to have put on such brutal appearance as to a lady whom he loved so dearly, is never thought on. The truth is, that in all such deep affections as had subsisted between Hamlet and Ophelia, there is a stock of supererogatory love, if I may venture to use the expression, which in any great grief of heart, especially where that which preys upon the mind cannot be communicated, confers a kind of indulgence upon the grieved party to express itself, even to its heart's dearest object in the language of a temporary alienation. But it is not alienation, it is a distraction purely, and so it always makes itself to be felt by that object. It is not anger but grief assuming the appearance of anger, love awkwardly counterfeiting hate, a sweet countenance is when they try to frown, but such sternness and fierce disgust as Hamlet is made to show is no counterfeit, but a real face of absolute aversion, of irreconcilable alienation. It may be said he puts on the madman, but then he should only so far put on this counterfeit lunacy, as his own real distraction will give him leave, that is, incompletely, imperfectly, not in that confirmed, practised way like a master of his art, or as Dame Quickly would say, like one of those harlotry players. I mean no disrespect to any actor, but the sort of pleasure which Shakespeare's plays give in the acting seems to me not at all to differ from that which the audience receive from those of other writers, and they being in themselves essentially so different from all others. I must conclude that there is something in the nature of acting which levels all distinctions, and in fact, who does not speak indifferently of the gamester and of Macbeth as fine stage performances, and praise the Mrs. Beverley in the same way as the Lady Macbeth of Mrs. Ayres? Bavadera and Callista and Isabella and Euphrasia are they less liked than Imogene, or than Juliet, or than Desdemona? Are they not spoken of and remembered in the same way? Is not a female performer as great, as he call it, in one as in the other, did not Garrick shine, and was not he ambitious of shining in every drawling tragedy that his wretched day produced, the productions of the Hills and the Murphys and the Browns? And shall he have that honour to dwell in our minds for ever as an inseparable concomitant with Shakespeare? A kindred mind, 
Oh, who can read that affecting sonnet of Shakespeare which alludes to his profession as a player? Oh, for my sake do you with fortune chide, the guilty goddess of my harmful deeds, that did not better for my life provide than public means, which public custom breeds, thence comes in that my name receives a brand, and almost thence my nature is subdued to what it works in, like the dyer's hand. All that other confession. Alas, tis true, I have gone here and there, and made myself a motley to thy view, gored my own thoughts, so cheap what is most dear. Who can read these instances of jealous self-watchfulness in our sweet Shakespeare, and dream of any congeniality between him and one that, by every tradition of him, appears to have been as mere a player as ever existed, to have had his mind tainted with the lowest player's vices, envy and jealousy and miserable cravings after applause, one who, in the exercise of a profession, was jealous even of the women performers that stood in his way, a manager full of managerial tricks and strategies and man finesse, that any resemblance should be dreamed of between him and Shakespeare, Shakespeare who, in the plenitude and consciousness of his own powers, could with that noble modesty which we can neither imitate nor appreciate, express himself thus of his own sense of his own defects. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, I am almost disposed to deny to Garrick the merit of being an admirer of Shakespeare, a true lover of his excellences. He certainly was not. For would any true lover of them have admitted into his matchless scenes such rival trash as Tate and Kibber and the rest of them that, with their darkness durst to front his light, have voiced it into the acting plays of Shakespeare? I believe it impossible that he could have had a proper reverence for Shakespeare, and have condescended to go through that interpolated scene in Richard III, in which Richard tries to break his wife's heart by telling her he loves another woman, and says, if she survives this, she is immortal. Yet I doubt not he delivered this vulgar stuff with as much anxiety of emphasis as any of the genuine parts, and for acting it is as well calculated as any. But we have seen the parts of Richard lately produce great fame to an actor by his manner of playing it, and it lets us into the secret of acting and of popular judgments of Shakespeare derived from acting. Not one of the spectators who have witnessed Mrs. C.'s exertions in that part, but has come away with the proper conviction that Richard is a very wicked man and kills little children in their beds, with something like the pleasure which the giant and ogres in children's books are represented to have taken in their practice. Moreover, that he is very close and shrewd and devilish cunning, for you could see that by his eye. But is in fact this the impression we have in reading the Richard of Shakespeare? Do we feel anything like disgust, as we do at that butcher-like representation of him that passes for him on the stage? A horror at his crimes blends with the effect which we feel. But how is it qualified, how is it carried off, by the rich intellect which he displays, his resources, his wit? his buoyant spirit, his vast knowledge and insight into characters, the poetry of his part, not an atom of all which is made perceivable in Mr. C.'s ways of acting it. Nothing but his crimes, his actions, is visible. They are prominent and staring. The murderer sends out, but where is lofty genius, the man of vast capacity, the profound, the witty, accomplished Richard? The truth is, the characters of Shakespeare are so much the objects of meditation rather than of interest or curiosity as to their actions, that while we are reading any of his great criminal characters, Macbeth, Richard, even Iago, we think not so much of the crimes which they commit as of the ambition, the aspiring spirit, the intellectual activity which prompts them to overleap those moral fences. Barnwell is a wretched murderer. There is a certain fitness between his neck and the rope. He is a legitimate heir to the gallows. Nobody who thinks at all can think of any alleviating circumstances in his case to make him a fit object of mercy. Or to take an instance from the higher tragedy, what else but a mere assassin is Glenalvin? Do you think of anything but of the crime which he commits, and the wreck which he deserves? 
That is all which we really think about him. Whereas in corresponding characters in Shakespeare so little do the actions comparatively affect us, that while the impulses, the inner mind, in all its perverted greatness, solely seems real and is exclusively attended to, the crime is comparatively nothing. But when we see these things represented, the acts which, if they do, are comparatively everything, their impulse is nothing. The state of sublime emotion into which we are elevated, with those images of night and horror which Macbeth is made to utter, that solemn prelude with which he entertains at the time till the bell shall strike which is to call him to murder Duncan, when we no longer read it in a book, when you have given up that fathish ground of abstraction which reading possesses over seeing, and come to see a man in his bodily shape before our eyes, actually preparing to commit a murder, if the acting be true and impressive, as I have witnessed it in this case performance of that part, the painful anxiety about the act, the natural longing to prevent it, while it yet seems unperpetrated, the too close pressing semblance of reality, give a pain and an uneasiness which totally destroy all the delight which the words in the book convey but the deed doing never presses upon us with a painful sense of presence it rather seems to belong to history to something past and inevitable if it has anything to do with time at all the sublime images the poetry alone is that which is present to our minds in the reading so to see lear acted to see an old man tottering about the stage with a walking-stick, turned out of doors by his daughters in a rainy night, has nothing in it but what is painful and disgusting. We want to take him into shelter and relieve him. That is all the feeling which the acting of Lear ever produced in me. But the Lear of Shakespeare cannot be acted. The contemptible machinery by which they mimic the storm which he goes out in is not more inadequate to represent the horrors of the real elements than any actor can be to represent Lear. They might more easily propose to personate the Satan of Milton upon a stage, or one of Michelangelo's several figures. The greatness of Lear is not in corporal dimensions, but in intellectual. The explosions of his passion are terrible as a volcano. They are storms turning up and disclosing to the bottom that sea, his mind, with all its vast riches. It is his mind which is laid bare. This case of flesh and blood seems too insignificant to be thought on, even as he himself neglects it. On the stage we see nothing but corporal infirmities and weakness, the impotence of rage. While we read it, we see not Lear, but we are Lear, we are in his mind, we are sustained by grandeur which baffles the malice of daughters and storms, in the aberrations of his reason we discover a mighty irregular power of reasoning, methodized from the ordinary purposes of life, but exerting its powers, as the wind blows where it listeth, at will upon the corruptions and abuses of mankind. What have looks or tones to do with that sublime identification of his age with that of the heavens themselves? When it is reproaches to them for conniving at the injustice of his children, he reminds them that they themselves are old. What gesture shall we appropriate to this? What has a voice or the eye to do with such things? But the play is beyond all art, as it tamperings with its show. It is too hard and stony. It must have love scenes and a happy ending. It is not enough that Cordelia is a daughter. She must shine as a lover, too. Tatus put his hook in the nostrils of this Leviathan, for Garrick and his followers, the showmen of the scene, to draw the mighty beast about more easily. A happy ending, as if the living martyrdom that Lear had gone through, the flaying of his feelings alive, did not make a fair dismissal from the stage of life the only decorous thing for him. If he is to live and be happy after, if he could sustain this world's burden after, why all this pudder and preparation? Why torment us with all this unnecessary sympathy? As if the childish pleasure of getting his gilt robes and scepter again could tempt him to act over again his misused station. As if at his years and with his experience anything was left but to die. Lear is essentially impossible to be represented on a stage. 
but how many dramatic personages are there in shakespeare which is though more tractable and feasible if i may so speak than lear yet from some circumstance some adjunct to their character are improper to be shown to our bodily eye othello for instance nothing can be more soothing or more flattering to the nobler parts of our natures than to read of a young venetian lady of highest extraction through the force of love and from a sense of merit in him whom she loved laying aside every consideration of kindred and country and colour and wedding with coal black moor or such he is represented in the imperfect state of knowledge respecting foreign countries in those days compared with our own or in compliance with popular notions that the moors are now well enough known to be by many shades less worthy of a white moment's fancy it is the perfect triumph of virtue over accidents of the imagination over the senses she sees othello's colour in his mind but upon the stage when the imagination is no longer the ruling faculty but we are left to our poor unassisted senses i appeal to every one that has seen othello played whether he did not on the contrary sink othello's mind in his colour whether he did not find something extremely revolting in the courtship and wedded caresses of othello and desdemona and whether the actual sight of the thing did not overweigh all that beautiful compromise which you make in reading and the reason it should do so is obvious because there is just so much reality presented to our senses as to give a perception of disagreement with not enough of belief in the internal motives all that which is unseen to overpower and reconcile the first and obvious prejudices note of author the error of supposing that because othello's colour does not offend us in the reading it should also not offend us in the seeing is just such a fallacy as supposing that an adam and eve in a picture shall affect us just as they do in the poem but in the poem we for a while have paradisical senses given us which vanish when we see a man and his wife without clothes in the picture the painters themselves feel this as is apparent by the awkward shifts they have resource to to make them look not quite naked by a sort of prophetic anachronism antedating the invention of fig leaves so in the reading of the play we see with desdemona's eyes in the seeing of it we are forced to look with our own End of author's note what we see upon a stage is body and bodily action what you are conscious of in reading is almost exclusively the mind and its movements and this i think may sufficiently account for the very different sort of delight with which the same play so often affects us in the reading and the seeing it requires little reflection to perceive that if those characters in shakespeare which are within the presence of nature have yet something in them which appeals too exclusively to the imagination to admit of their being made objects to the senses without suffering a change in the diminution and the diminution that still stronger the objector must lie against representing another line of characters which shakespeare has introduced to give a wildness and supernatural elevation to his senses as if to remove them still farther from that assimilation to common life in which their excellence is vulgarly supposed to consist when we read the incantations of those terrible beings the witches of macbeth though so some of the ingredients of their hellish composition savour of the grotesque yet is the effect upon us other than the most serious and appalling that can be imagined do we not feel spellbound as macbeth was can any mirth accompany a sense of their presence we might as well laugh under consciousness of the principle of evil himself being truly and really present with us but attempt to bring these beings onto a stage and to turn them instantly into so many old women that men and children are to laugh at contrary to the old saying that seeing is believing the sight actually destroys the faith and the mirth in which we indulge at their expense when we see these creatures upon a stage seems to be a sort of indemnification which we make to ourselves for the terror which they put us in when reading made them an object of belief when we surrendered up our reason to the poet as children to their nurses and their elders and we laugh at our fears as children who thought they saw something in the dark triumph 
when the bringing in of a candle discovers the vanity of their fears. For this exposure of supernatural agents upon a stage is truly bringing in a candle to expose their own delusiveness. It is the solitary taper and the book that generates a faith in these terrors. A ghost by chandelier light, and in good company, deceives no spectators. A ghost that can be measured by the eye and in its human dimension, and a well-dressed audience, shall arm the most nervous child against any apprehension as the sight of a well-lighted house, and a well-dressed audience, shall arm the most nervous child against any apprehensions. As Tom Brown says of the impenetrable skin of Achilles, with his impenetrable armour over it, Bully Dawson would afford the devil with such advantages. Much has been said, and deservedly, a reprobation of the vile mixture which Dryden has thrown into the tempest. Doubtless, without some such vicious alloy, the impure ears of that age would never have set out to hear so much innocence of love as is contained in the sweet courtship of Ferdinand and Miranda. But is the tempest of Shakespeare at all a subject for stage representation? It is one thing to read of an enchanter, and to believe the wondrous tale while we are reading it, but to have a conjurer brought up before us in his conjuring gown, with his spirits about him, which none but himself and some hundred of favoured spectators before the curtain are supposed to see, involves such a quantity of, of the hateful incredible, that all our reverence for the author cannot hinder us from perceiving such gross attempts upon the senses to be in the highest degree childish and inefficient. Spirits and fairies cannot be represented, they cannot even be painted, they can only be believed. But the elaborate and anxious provision of scenery, which the luxury of the age demands, in these cases works a quite contrary effect to what is intended. That which in comedy, or plays of familiar life, adds so much to the life of imitation, and plays which appeal to the higher faculties, positively destroys the illusion which it is introduced to aid. A parlour or a drawing-room, a library opening into a garden, a garden with an alcove in it, a street or the piazza of Covent Garden, does well enough in a scene. We are content to give as much credit to it as it demands, or rather, we think little about it. It is little more than reading at the top of a page, scene, a garden. We do not imagine ourselves there, but we readily admit the imitation of familiar objects. But to think by the help of painted trees and caverns, which were known to be painted, to transport our minds to Prospero and his island and his lonely cell, no divorce, it will be said these things are done in pictures. But pictures and scenes are very different things. Painting is a world of itself, but in scene painting there is the attempt to deceive. And there is a discordancy never to be got over between painted scenes and real people. End of author's note. Or by the aid of a fiddle dexterously thrown in, in an interval of speaking, to make us believe that we hear those supernatural noises of which the isle was full. The orrery lecturer at the haymarket might as well hope, by his musical glasses cleverly stationed out of sight behind his apparatus, to make us believe that we do indeed hear the crystal spheres ring out at that time, which, if it were to enwrap our fancy long, Milton thinks, time would run back and fetch the age of gold and speckled vanity, would thicken soon and die, a leprous sin would melt from earthly mould, yet hell itself would pass away, and leave its dolorous mansions to the peering day. The Garden of Eden, with our first parents in it, is not more impossible to be shown on the stage than the enchanted isle with its no less interesting and innocent first settlers. The subject of scenery is closely connected with that of the dresses which are so anxiously attended to on our stage. I remember the last time I saw Macbeth played. The discrepancy I felt at the changes of garment which he varied, the shiftings and reshiftings like a Romish priest at Mars. The luxury of stage improvements and the opportunity of the public eye require this. The coronation robe of the Scottish monarch was fairly a counterpart to that which our king wears when he goes to Parliament House, just so full and cumbersome, and set out with ermine and pearls. And if things must be represented, I see not what to find fault within this. But in reading, what robe are we conscious of? 
Some dim images of royalty, a crown and sceptre, may float before our eyes. But who shall describe the fashion of it? Do we see in our mind's eye what web or any other robe make you could pattern? This is the inevitable consequence of imitating everything, to make all things natural, whereas the reading of a tragedy is a fine abstraction. It presents to the fancy just so much of external appearances as to make us feel that we are among flesh and blood, while by far the greater and better part of our imagination is employed upon the thoughts and internal machinery of the character. But in acting, scenery, dress, the most contemptible things call upon us to judge of their naturalness. Perhaps it would be no bad similitude to liken the pleasure which we take in seeing one of these fine plays acted, compared with that quiet delight which we find in the reading of it, to the different feelings with which a reviewer, and a man that is not a reviewer, reads a fine poem. The occurs critical habit, the being called upon to judge and pronounce, must make it quite a different thing to the former. In seeing these plays acted, we are affected just as judges. When Hamlin compares the two pictures of Gertrude's first and second husband, who wants to see the pictures? But in the acting, a miniature must be looked out, which we know not to be the picture, but only to show how finely a miniature may be represented. This showing of everything levels all things. It makes tricks, bows, and curtsies of importance. Mrs. S. never got more fame by anything than by the manner in which she dismisses the guests in the banquet scene in Macbeth. It is as much remembered as any of her thrilling tones or impressive looks. But does such a trifle as this enter into the imaginations of the readers of that wild and wonderful scene? Does not the mind dismiss the feasters as rapidly as it can? Does it care about the gracefulness of the doing it? But by acting, and judging of acting, all these non-essentials are raised into an importance injurious to the main interest of the play. I have confined my observations to the tragic parts of Shakespeare. It would be no very difficult task to extend the inquiry to his comedies, and to show why Falstaff, Shallow, Sir Hugh Evans, and the rest are equally incompatible with the stage representation. The length to which this essay has run will make it, I am afraid, sufficiently distasteful to the amateurs of the theatre, without going any deeper into the subject at present. End of On the Tragedies of Shakespeare by Charles Lamb Philosophy of Composition this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Matthew M. Perry. The Philosophy of Composition by Edgar Allan Poe. Published in 1846. Charles Dickens, in a note now lying before me, alluding to an examination I once made of the mechanism of Barnaby Rouge, says, By the way, are you aware that Godwin wrote his Caleb Williams backwards? He first involved his hero in a web of difficulties, forming the second volume, and then, for the first, cast about him for some mode of accounting for what had been done. I cannot think this the precise mode of procedure on the part of Godwin, and indeed what he himself acknowledges is not altogether in accordance with Mr. Dickens's idea. But the author of Caleb Williams was too good an artist not to perceive the advantage derivable from at least a somewhat similar process. Nothing is more clear than that every plot worth the name must be elaborated to its denouement before anything be attempted with the pen. It is only with the denouement constantly in view that we can give a plot its indispensable air of consequence or causation by making the incidents, and especially the tone at all points, tend to the development of the intention. There's a radical error, I think, in the usual mode of constructing a story. Either history affords a thesis, or one is suggested by an incident of the day, or, at best, 
The author sets himself to work in the combination of striking events to form merely the basis of his narrative, designing, generally, to fill in with description, dialogue, or autorial comment whatever crevices of fact or action may, from page to page, render themselves apparent. I prefer commencing with the consideration of an effect. Keeping originality always in view, for he is false to himself who ventures to dispense with so obvious and so easily attainable a source of interest, I say to myself, in the first place, of the innumerable effects or impressions of which the heart, the intellect, or, more generally, the soul is susceptible, what one shall I, on the present occasion, select, having chosen a novel first, and secondly, a vivid effect, I consider whether it can be best wrought by incident or tone, whether by ordinary incidents and peculiar tone, or the converse, or by peculiarity both of incident and tone, afterward looking about me, or rather within, for such combinations of event or tone as shall best aid me in the construction of the effect. I have often thought how interesting a magazine paper might be written by any author who would, that is to say, who could, detail, step by step, the process by which any one of his compositions attained its ultimate point of completion. Why such a paper has never been given to the world, I am much at a loss to say, but perhaps the autorial vanity has more to do with the omission than any one other cause. Most writers, Poets in especial prefer having it understood that they compose by a species of fine frenzy, an ecstatic intuition, and would positively shudder at letting the public take a peep behind the scenes at the elaborate and vacillating crudities of thought, at the true purposes seized only at the last moment, at the innumerable glimpses of idea that arrived not at the maturity of full view, at the fully matured fancies discarded in despair as unimaginable, at the cautious selections and rejections, at the painful erasures and interpolations, in a word, at the wheels and pinions, the tackle for scene-shifting, the step-ladders and demon-traps, the cock's feathers, the red paint and the black patches which, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, constitute the properties of the literary historio. I am aware, on the other hand, that the case is by no means common in which an author is at all in condition to retrace the steps by which his conclusions have been attained. In general, suggestions having arisen pell-mell are pursued and forgotten in a similar manner. For my own part, I have neither sympathy with the repugnance alluded to, nor, at any time, the least difficulty in recalling to mind the progressive steps of any of my compositions, and, since the interest of an analysis or reconstruction, such as I have considered a desideratum, is quite independent of any real or fancied interest in the thing analyzed, it will not be regarded as a breach of decorum on my part to show the modus operandi by which some of my own works was put together. I select the raven as most generally known. It is my design to render it manifest that no one point in its composition is referable either to accident or intuition, that the work proceeded step by step to its completion with the precision and rigid consequence of a mathematical problem. Let us dismiss, as irrelevant to the poem per se, the circumstance, or say, the necessity, which, in the first place, gave rise to the intention of composing a poem that should suit at once the popular and the critical taste. We commence, then, with this intention. The initial consideration was that of extent. If any literary work is too long to be read at one sitting, we must be content to dispense with the immensely important effect derivable from unity of impression. For, if two sittings be required, the affairs of the world interfere, and everything like totality is at once destroyed. But since, ceteris paribus, 
no poet can afford to dispense with anything that may advance his design, it but remains to be seen whether there is, in extent, any advantage to counterbalance the loss of unity which attends it. Here I say no, at once. What we term a long poem is, in fact, merely a succession of brief ones, that is to say, of brief poetical effects. It is needless to demonstrate that a poem is such only inasmuch as it intensely excites by elevating the soul, and all intense excitements are, through a psychical necessity, brief. For this reason, at least, one half of the paradise lost is essentially prose, a succession of poetical excitements interspersed inevitably with corresponding depressions. The whole being deprived, through the extremities of its length, of the vastly important artistic element, totality, or unity of effect. It appears evident, then, that there is a distinct limit as regards length to all works of literary art, the limit of a single sitting, and that, although in certain classes of prose composition, such as Robinson Crusoe, demanding no unity, this limit may be advantageously overpassed, it can never properly be overpassed in a poem. Within this limit, the extent of a poem may be made to bear mathematical relation to its merit, in other words, to the excitement or elevation, again, in other words, to the degree of the true poetical effect which it is capable of inducing. For it is clear that the brevity must be in direct ratio of the intensity of the intended effect. This, with one provisio, that a certain degree of duration is absolutely requisite for the production of any effect at all. Holding in view these considerations, as well as that degree of excitement which I deemed not above the popular, while not below the critical taste, I reached at once what I conceived the proper length for my intended poem, a length of about one hundred lines. It is, in fact, a hundred and eight. My next thought concerned the choice of an impression or effect to be conveyed, and here I may as well observe that throughout the construction I kept steadily in view the design of rendering the work universally appreciable. I should be carried too far out of my immediate topic were I to demonstrate a point which I have repeatedly insisted, and which, with the poetical, stands not in the slightest need of demonstration. The point... I mean, that beauty is the sole legitimate province of the poem. A few words, however, in euclidiation of my real meaning, which some of my friends have evinced a dispossession to misrepresent, that pleasure, which is at once the most intense, the most elevating, and the most pure, is, I believe, found in the contemplation of the beautiful, when, indeed, men speak of beauty, they mean precisely not a quality, as is supposed, but an effect. They refer, in short, just to that intense and pure elevation of the soul, not of intellect or of heart, upon which I have commented, and which is experienced in the consequence of contemplating the beautiful. Now, I designate beauty as the province of the poem merely because it is an obvious rule of art that effects should be made to spring from direct causes, that objects should be attained through means best adapted for their attainment. No one, as yet, having been weak enough to deny that the peculiar elevation alluded to is most readily attained in the poem. Now, the object truth, or the satisfaction of the intellect, and the object passion, or the excitement of the heart, are, although attainable to a certain extent in poetry, far more readily attainable in prose. Truth, in fact, demands a precision, and passion, a homeliness. The truly passionate will comprehend me which are absolutely antagonistic to that beauty which, I maintain, is the excitement or pleasurable elevation of the soul. It by no means follows, from anything here said, that passion, or even truth, may not be introduced, and even profitably introduced, into a poem, for they may serve in euclidiation, or aid the general effect, as do discords in music, by contrast. But, the true artist will always contrive, first, to tone them into proper subservience to the predominant aim, and, secondly, to unveil them, as far as possible, in that beauty which is the atmosphere and essence of the poem. 
Regarding, then, beauty as my province, my next question referred to the tone of its highest manifestation, and all experience has shown that this tone is one of sadness. Beauty of whatever kind in its supreme development invariably excites the sensitive soul to tears. Melancholy is thus the most legitimate of all the poetical tones. The length, the province, and the tone being thus determined, I betook myself to ordinary induction with the view of obtaining some artistic piquancy which might serve me as a keynote in the construction of the poem, some pivot upon which the whole structure might turn. In carefully thinking over all the usual artistic effects, or more properly points in the theatrical sense, I did not fail to perceive immediately that no one had been so universally employed as that of the refrain. The universality of its employment sufficed to assure me of its intrinsic value and spared me the necessity of submitting it to analysis. I consider it, however, with regard to its susceptibility of improvement, and soon saw it to be in a primitive condition. As commonly used, the refrain or burden not only is limited to lyric verse, but depends for its impression upon the force of monotone, both in sound and thought. The pleasure is deduced solely from the sense of identity, of repetition. I resolved to diversify, and so heighten the effect, by adhering in general to the monotone of sound, while I continually varied that of thought. That is to say, I determined to produce continually novel effects by variation of the application of the refrain, the refrain itself remaining, for the most part, unvaried. These points being settled, I next bethought me of the nature of my refrain. Since its application was to be repeatedly varied, it was clear that the refrain itself must be brief, for there would have been an insurmountable difficulty in frequent variations of application in any sense of length. In proportion to the brevity of the sentence would, of course, be the facility of the variation. This led me at once to a single word as the best refrain. The question now arose as to the character of the word. Having made up my mind to a refrain, the division of the poem into stanzas was of course a corollary, the refrain forming the close to each stanza. That such a close, to have force, must be sonorous and susceptible of protracted emphasis, admitted no doubt, and these considerations inevitably led me to the long O as the most sonorous vowel in connection with R as the most producible consonant. The sound of the refrain being thus determined, it became necessary to select a word embodying this sound, and at the same time in its fullest possible keeping with that melancholy which I had predetermined as the tone of the poem. In such a search, it would have been absolutely impossible to overlook the word nevermore. In fact, it was the very first which presented itself. The next desideratum was a pretext for the continuous use of the one word nevermore. In observing the difficulty which I had at once found in inventing a sufficiently plausible reason for its continuous repetition, I did not fail to perceive that this difficulty arose solely from the preassumption that the word was to be so continuously or monotonously spoken by a human being. I did not fail to perceive, in short, that the difficulty lay in the reconciliation of this monotony with the exercise of reason on the part of the creature repeating the word. Here, then, immediately arose the idea of a non-reasoning creature capable of speech, and very naturally a parrot, in the first instance, suggested itself, but was superseded forthwith by a raven as equally capable of speech, and infinitely more in keeping with the intended tone. I had now gone so far as the conception of a raven, the bird of ill omen, monotonously repeating the one word nevermore, at the conclusion of each stanza in a poem of melancholy tone and in length of about one hundred lines, now, never losing sight of the object, supremeness or perfection at all points, I asked myself, of all melancholy topics, what? according to the universal understanding of mankind, is the most melancholy. Death was the obvious reply. And when, I said, is this most melancholy of topics most poetical? 
From what I have already explained at some length, the answer here also is obvious. When it most closely allies itself to beauty, the death, then, of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world, and equally is it beyond doubt that the lips best suited for such a topic are those of a bereaved lover. I had now to combine the two ideas of a lover lamenting his deceased mistress and a raven continuously repeating the word nevermore. I had to combine these, bearing in mind my design of varying at every turn the application of the word repeated, but the only intelligible mode of such combination is that of imagining the raven employing the word in answer to the queries of the lover. And here it was that I saw at once the opportunity afforded for the effect on which I had been depending, that is to say, the effect of the variation of application. I saw that I could make the first query propounded by the lover, the first query to which the raven should reply, nevermore, that I could make this first query a commonplace one, the second less so, the third still less, and so on, until at greater length the lover, startled from his original nonchalance by the melancholy character of the word itself, by its frequent repetition, and a consideration of the ominous reputation of the fowl that uttered it, is at length excited to superstition, and wildly propounds queries of a far different character, queries whose solution he has passionately at heart, propounds them half in superstition and half that species of despair which delights in self-torture, propounds them not altogether because he believes in the prophetic or demonic character of the bird, which, reason assures him, is merely repeating a lesson learned by rote, but because he experiences a frenzied pleasure in so modelling his questions as to receive from the expected nevermore the most delicious because the most intolerable of sorrows. Perceiving the opportunity thus afforded me, or, more strictly, thus forced upon me in the progress of the construction, I first enabled in my mind the climax or concluding query, that query to which nevermore should be in the last place an answer, that query in reply to which this word nevermore should involve the utmost conceivable amount of sorrow and despair. Here then the poem may be said to have had its beginning, at the end, where all works of art should begin. For it was here, at this point of my preconsiderations, that I first put pen to paper in the composition of the stanza. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by the God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if, within the distant Eden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. I composed this stanza at this point, first that, by establishing the climax, I might the better vary and graduate, as regards seriousness and importance, the preceding queries of the lover, and secondly, that I might definitely settle the rhythm, the meter, and the length and general arrangement of the stanza, as well as graduate the stanzas which were to proceed, so that none of them might surpass this in rhythmical effect. Had I been able in the subsequent composition to construct more vigorous stanzas, I should, without scruple, have purposely enfeebled them so as not to interfere with the climatic effect. And here I may as well say a few words of the versification. My first object, as usual, was originality. The extent to which this has been neglected in versification is one of the most unaccountable things in the world. Admitting that there is little possibility of variety in mere rhythm, it is still clear that the possible varieties of meter and stanza are absolutely infinite, and yet, for centuries, no man in verse has ever done, or ever seemed to think of doing, an original thing. The fact is that originality, unless in the minds of very unusual force, is by no means a matter, as some suppose, of impulse or intuition. In general, to be found, it must be elaborately sought, and although a positive merit of the highest class, demands in its attainment less of invention than negation. Of course, I pretend to no originality in either the rhythm or meter of the raven. The former is trochaic, 
the latter is octameter acatalytic, alternating with heptameter catalytic, repeated in the refrain of the fifth verse and terminating with tetrameter catalytic. Less pedantically, the feet employed throughout, trochees, consist of a long syllable followed by a short. The first line of the stanza consists of eight of these feet, the second of seven and a half, in effect two-thirds, the third of eight, the fourth of seven and a half, the fifth of the same, the sixth three and a half. Now, each of these lines, taken individually, has been employed before, and what originality the raven has is in their combination into stanza. Nothing even remotely approaching this has ever been attempted. The effect of this originality of combination is aided by other unusual and some altogether novel effects, arising from an extension of the application of the principles of rhyme and alliteration. The next point to be considered was the mode of bringing together the lover and the raven, and the first branch of this consideration was the locale. For this, the most natural suggestion might seem to be a forest or the fields, but it has always appeared to me that a close circumspection of space is absolutely necessary to the effect of insulated incident. It has the force of a frame to a picture. It has an indisputable moral power in keeping concentrated the attention and, of course, must not be confounded with mere unity of place. I determined, then, to place the lover in his chamber, in a chamber rendered sacred to him by memories of her who had frequented it. The room is represented as richly furnished. This is in mere pursuance of the ideas I have already explained on the subject of beauty as the sole true poetical thesis. The locale being thus determined, I had now to introduce the bird, and the thought of introducing him through the window was inevitable. The idea of making the lover suppose, in the first instance, that the flapping of the wings of the bird against the shutter is a tapping at the door, originated in a wish to increase by prolonging the reader's curiosity and in a desire to admit the incidental effect arising from the lover's throwing open the door finding all dark and thence adopting the half fancy that it was the spirit of his mistress that knocked i made the night tempestuous first to account for the raven seeking admission and secondly for the effect of contrast with the physical serenity within the chamber I made the bird alight on the bust of Pallas, also for the effect of contrast between the marble and the plumage. It being understood that the bust was absolutely suggested by the bird, the bust of Pallas being chosen, first, as most in keeping with the scholarship of the lover, and secondly, for the seriousness of the word, Pallas, itself. About the middle of the poem, also, I have availed myself of the force of contrast with a view of deepening the ultimate impression, for example, an air of the fantastic, approaching as nearly to the ludicrous as was admissible, is given to the raven's entrance. He comes in, quote, with many a flirt and flutter. Not the least obeisance made he, not a moment stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door. In the two stanzas which follow, the design is more obviously carried out. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance at war, though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore, Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as nevermore the effect of the denouement being thus provided for i immediately dropped the fantastic for a tone of the most profound seriousness this tone commencing in the stanza directly following the last one quoted with the line but the raven sitting lonely on that placid bus spoke only etc from this epoch the lover no longer jests no longer sees anything even of the fantastic in the raven's demeanour 
He speaks of him as a grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, and feels the fiery eyes burning into his bosom's core. This revolution of thought or fancy on the lover's part is intended to induce a similar one on the part of the reader, to bring the mind into a proper frame for the denouement, which is now brought about as rapidly and as directly as possible. With the denouement proper, with the raven's reply, nevermore, to the lover's final demand if he shall meet his mistress in another world, the poem, in its obvious phase, that of a simple narrative, may be said to have had its completion. So far, everything is within the limits of the accountable, of the real. A raven, having learned by rote the single word nevermore, and having escaped from the custody of its owner, is driven at midnight through the violence of a storm to seek admission at a window from which a light still gleams, the chamber window of a student occupied half in poring over a volume, half in dreaming of a beloved mistress deceased. The casement being thrown open at the fluttering of the bird's wings the bird itself perches on the most convenient seat out of the immediate reach of the student who amused by the incident and the oddity of the visitor's demeanour demands of it in jest and without looking for a reply its name the raven addressed answers with its customary word nevermore a word which finds immediate echo in the melancholy heart of the student who giving utterance aloud to certain thoughts suggested by the occasion is again startled by the fowl's repetition of nevermore the student now guesses the state of the case but is impelled as i have before explained by the human thirst for self-torture and in part by superstition to propound such queries to the bird as will bring him the lover the most of the luxury of sorrow through the anticipated answer nevermore with the indulgence to the extreme of this self-torture, the narration, in what I have deemed its first or obvious phase, has a natural termination, and so far there has been no overstepping of the limits of the real. But in subjects so handled, however skillfully, or with however vivid an array of incident, there is always a certain hardness or nakedness which repels the artistical eye. Two things are invariably required. First, some amount of complexity or more properly adaptation and secondly some amount of suggestiveness some undercurrent however indefinite of meaning it is this latter in a special which imparts to a work of art so much of that richness to borrow from colloquially a forcible term which we are too fond of confusing with the ideal it is the excess of the suggested meaning it is the rendering of this upper instead of the undercurrent of the theme which turns into prose and that of the very flattest kind the so-called poetry of the so-called transcendentalists holding these opinions i added the two concluding stanzas of the poem their suggestiveness being thus made to pervade all the narrative which has preceded them the undercurrent of meaning is rendered first apparent in the line Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven, nevermore. It will be observed that the words, from out my heart, involve the first metaphorical expression in the poem. They, with the answer, nevermore, dispose the mind to seek a moral in all that has been previously narrated. The reader begins now to regard the raven as emblematical but it is not until the very last line of the very last stanza that the intention of making him emblematical of mournful and never-ending remembrance is permitted distinctly to be seen. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End of essay. Possession by Adam H. Dickey
published in the Christian Science Journal, Volume 35, Number 3, June 1917. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by November 8, Echo Victor Victor. Possession by Adam H. Dickey. There is a belief among the mortals that they can become the privileged possessors or owners of something. When through the usual process of law a man acquires property, he has a strong desire to erect a fence around it and to keep everybody else away. Then follows the belief which is universally acknowledged, that he owns a certain amount of the earth's surface, and that the law protects and defends him in private possession thereof. He builds a house and occupies it, calls it his own, and no one is permitted to approach or to enter it contrary to his wishes, without being considered a trespasser. In our present degree of development, it is generally understood that property is something which should have an owner, that the earth and all that is contained therein may be divided into parts and parcels, and that different individuals may claim possession of more or less of it, to the exclusion of others. All this, however, is based on the supposition that matter is substance, and that man is the proprietor of it. Through the elusive processes of mortal belief, truth is apparently reversed. Thoughts are externalized into things, and these things are claimed, held, and dominated by individuals. Some people have a large amount of property, others a little, while a great many have none at all. This apparently unequal distribution of material possessions fosters envy, jealousy, and strife, often provoking the one who finds himself deprived of his heart's desire into the use of questionable means, if not of physical force, to gain his object. It would be safe to say that nine-tenths of all the war and contention in the world has been inaugurated and carried on because of the invasion of so-called property rights, or because of a desire to extend material possessions. Just as soon as a man finds himself in possession of a certain amount of matter, of houses or lands, of stocks or bonds, he is besieged by a sense of personal responsibility for his wealth, and a fear that he may at some time be dispossessed of it. The whole system of property rights and of the division of property is based upon the supposed substantiality of matter, an illusion which some day must be dispelled by the law of God, which declares that mind is the only substance. This change may not be brought about all at once, but through right thinking and conduct there will in due time be established the true concept namely that the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Rightfully speaking, everything in this world belongs to God, and through reflection to man, who is the image and likeness of God. When therefore we have reached the point in our demonstration where we can resolve things into thoughts, the multiplication of these thoughts will be possible, so that every individual may reflect and possess all that belongs to his Maker. In some lines of thought this ideal condition already prevails, for example, in mathematics. Let us suppose, however, that the figures used in making calculations, instead of being accepted as thoughts, were regarded as material objects. In such a case every mathematician or accountant would have to provide himself with a supply of figures, which would perhaps be made of some durable material like wood or iron and which he would keep on a shelf or locked in a drawer. When the mathematician wished to use the figures, he would take them out, arrange them in their proper order, and so be enabled to work out his problems. If in a busy season the accountant's supply of figures should become exhausted, he would have to purchase more or perhaps borrow them from his neighbor. He might approach a fellow worker and say, I wish you would lend me two or three fives and a few sevens this morning, I am out of these figures. His friend might reply, I am sorry, but I have been using so many fives and sevens lately in my work that I need all I have and cannot accommodate you. 
There might even be a shortage of figures which would affect the whole population, and there would be a scramble for a supply. The price of figures would advance, and if people really believed that these objects were a necessity, there would be such brisk competition that the price of enough figures to do business with would be out of all proportion to the cost of their production, and many people would have to get along without them. This condition of affairs, however, is made impossible by the fact that figures, instead of being things, are thoughts, and as such are everywhere present without limit or restriction. No contrivance of mortal mind, nor any scheme of manipulators, can take away from us one single figure, or deprive us of instantaneous access to all that we can possibly have use for. No war has ever been declared because one nation appropriated more than its share of the multiplication table, nor has any man been found guilty of using figures which he has surreptitiously taken from his neighbor. Figures are mental concepts, and as such they are available to everybody. Sometime it will be realized that not only is this true with regard to figures, but that every material object in the universe is but the counterfeit of some divine idea, and not what mortal mind represents it to be. The time will come when mortal mind will abandon its belief that ideas are represented by material objects, and when this time arrives there will be no fear of loss or damage. We shall then be able to carry out the instruction given by Jesus when he said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures, right ideas, in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. You may ask what all this has to do with our present demonstration. A great deal. Christian scientists may add to their peace of mind and freedom from responsibility by thinking along right lines and endeavoring to put into immediate practice the teachings of Christian science. If a man is engaged in a business which he believes to be his own, of which he thinks he is the creator and proprietor, and for the success of which he deems himself personally responsible, there may be a great sense of burden attaching to his position. He may suffer from poor business, loss of trade, or any of the beliefs which go with his particular occupation or profession, so long indeed as he feels that the business belongs exclusively to him. He will never be free from some of the countless beliefs that are supposed to affect trade in general and his occupation in particular. The remedy for this condition is for the man to begin to declare and to know that all is mind and mind's ideas, that there is nothing whatever about his business that is limited or material. If God is the creator of all, and if everything in this universe belongs to him, then this business which the man calls his own is really God's, and the man becomes the master of it only to the degree that he conforms his thoughts and his daily transactions to the law of God. If he recognizes this and applies his understanding of the principle of Christian science to his work, his fear and uncertainty will vanish. He will find himself conducting and carrying on business in the manner God requires it to be done, and he will exercise dominion and control over it just to the extent that he places himself under the unerring direction of divine mind. If a woman considers herself the owner of a home and that everything in it is hers, if she believes she has furniture and fixtures which are her personal property, if she feels that she has servants to manage and that she must assume personal control over them, as well as over every other household accessory, she may become so confused and distracted as to find herself utterly inadequate to control the situation. But if she is willing to accept God as the ruler of her household, to convert things into thoughts, and to understand that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, if she can realize that divine intelligence governs and controls her servants, her house, and everything that is contained therein, 
she will immediately lose all sense of care, fear, and responsibility, and find that the divine law of peace and harmony has taken possession of her household and manages it. If she realizes that the servants are working for God and not for her, that everything about the house is designed to bring out and express the law of perfection, things will run much more smoothly for all connected with this establishment, and peace and joy will come to all who enter therein. There is another phase of possession which is perhaps one of the strongest of mortal beliefs. Parents believe they are the privileged creators of something, that they can usurp the creative power of divine mind and have children of their own, for whose bringing up, education, and future welfare they are entirely responsible. This feeling on the part of parents opens the door wide to the suggestion of failure, and the trials and tribulations which are supposed to go with the ownership and control of children assail them from every side. They must learn that God is the only father and the only mother, that man is the offspring of God, that he is not physical and material, but spiritual, reflecting and expressing the wisdom, love, and intelligence of infinite being. As soon as this line of thought is touched upon, the false sense of responsibility which mortal mind has placed upon parents is taken away, and they can then in the right way trust God to take care of their children, knowing that nothing can interfere with the harmonious results which accompany divine protection. All belongs to God, nothing belongs to us. Man is neither a creator nor an owner. As Christian scientists, we can begin the realization of this at once, and the results will be speedy and satisfactory. But when we relinquish all thought of personal possession, this does not mean that we must sacrifice everything we hold dear, or that we shall really be deprived of anything. On the contrary, it means that through an increased understanding that all is mind and the ideas of mind, we shall gradually come into possession of all that is worth while. This is surely a more gratifying way to bring God into our experience than to cling to the old material illusions. The mere act of surrendering something is not in itself a virtue, nor is there anything to be gained by assuming a false sense of humility. It is true that much is given up, but it is the old, unsatisfactory beliefs which we are really parting with, and these are supplanted by right ideas, giving to us a greater sense of freedom, power, and possession than we ever had before. What did Jesus mean by the statement, quote, He that hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath not, from him shall be taken away that which he hath, end quote. Why this? That the one who has the right idea is really the one that hath, and his possessions are bound to increase, while the one who has the wrong thought is the one that hath not, and he must of necessity lose even that which he seems to have. What we need to do, then, is to change our method of thinking. Jesus saying, quote, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, end quote, is made possible only through Christian science. On page 62 of Miscellaneous Writings, our leader says, quote, Holding the right idea of man in my mind, I can improve my own and other people's individuality, health, and morals. End quote. All things are accomplished through the right idea, which asserts itself in human consciousness and dispossesses us of our false beliefs. A knowledge of the right idea in Christian science adds constantly to our store of wisdom and understanding. It is a law of metaphysics that thought externalizes itself. Therefore, when we attain the standpoint from which we can see all material things as beliefs only, and that these things can be transformed and improved through holding the right idea, we shall then begin to bring into our experience the things referred to by Paul when he said, quote, 
eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. End quote. Another line of thought which suggests itself at this juncture is that human beings believe they are in possession of a mind of their own, and that they can think and will as they please with respect to this mind. This belief leads to another erroneous conclusion, namely that we are in possession of a body of our own, that we have personal eyes, ears, lungs, and a private stomach, all of which we believe to be material, and for the well-being of which we are responsible. When this error takes possession of us, the next thing that mortal mind claims is an ability to deprive us of a sight, hearing, etc., and that our stomach can become disordered or diseased. This is all the result of believing in another creator besides God, another intelligence and power to which we yield obedience. Know ye not, Paul says, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. The only remedy for the ills of the flesh is to correct these false beliefs by introducing the right idea. On page 415 of Science and Health, our leader says, quote, Note how thought makes the face pallid. It either retards the circulation or quickens it, causing a pale or flushed cheek. In the same way thought increases or diminishes the secretions, the action of the lungs, of the bowels, and of the heart, the muscles moving quickly or slowly, and impelled or palsied by thought, represent the action of all the organs of the human system, including brain and viscera. To remove the error producing disorder, you must calm and instruct mortal mind with immortal truth." End quote. In mortal mind's method of thinking, thoughts are externalized as matter and are called the body. When we understand this, and grasp what Mrs. Eddy teaches in regard to the externalization of thought, we shall see that our bodies are nothing more or less than the outward expression of our thought. Therefore, to heal what seems to be a diseased condition of the body, we must drop all thought of it as material and recognize it as a purely mental product, an objectified condition of material sense, the correction of which by replacing the false belief with the spiritual idea will, according to the law of God, produce health and harmony. God is the only creator, and all that he creates must be like himself. Man is the individualized aggregation of right ideas, the compound idea of God, which includes these right ideas. For God to know is to be, Mrs. Eddy says, no and yes, page 16. Knowing is being, therefore what man knows of God constitutes his being, and the consciousness of man consists only of the knowing of those right ideas which already exist in the mind of God. It is scientifically impossible to put a wrong thought into consciousness, and there can be no imperfection in mind, since whatever God knows is perfect and inviolable and can never be changed or altered in any way. Nothing exists but God and what God creates. Consequently, there is only one right idea of anything. Quote, the divine mind maintains all identities, from a blade of grass to a star, as distinct and eternal. End quote. Science and Health, page 70. Mortal belief creates the human eye and declares it to be the organ of sight, while in reality sight is a quality of mind, entirely independent of iris, pupil, lens, or other parts comprising the visual organism. When Jesus said that the light of the body is the eye, he was not referring to a material eye, but to a mental condition. Hence what mind knows about the thing we call I is all there is to it. This is also true in regard to what mortal mind calls heart, liver, lungs, and all else that goes to make up the so-called material body. Mortal mind claims that man is organized matter, but mortal mind's beliefs are not substantive, 
and the fact remains that the only organization there is, or ever can be, is that compound spiritual idea of which this material organism is the counterfeit. Inasmuch as there is only one right idea of everything, there is only one right concept of stomach. It is not made of matter, it is not a material thing. It is a mental concept, and as such has its rightful place in the divine mind. Any other concept of stomach is false and misleading. It is time for Christian scientists to stop trying to doctor sick organs, and devote themselves to exchanging their imperfect models for better and more improved beliefs, which is the only true method of healing. God is the law of health and harmony to all his own ideas, and not only is this true, but the law of God which governs the perfect spiritual idea is also the law of perfection to the human belief of things, and this extends to every organ of the human system. Whatever God knows about hand, eye, foot, is all there is to know about them. He knows that they are not material, but that they are perfect, harmonious, and useful ideas, and that their identity is distinct and eternal. If a man has the wrong concept of hand, eye, foot, his only salvation is to get the right idea concerning these useful members. If his body should be injured, it would be his concept of body that is affected, not God's. And the remedy is for him quickly to give up his erroneous belief of body and acquaint himself with God's idea. In the words of Eliphaz, Acquaint now thyself with him, God and be at peace. On page 218 of Miscellany, Mrs. Eddy writes, quote, Neither the Old nor the New Testament furnishes reasons or examples for the destruction of the human body, but for its restoration to life and health as the scientific proof of God with us. The power and prerogative of truth are to destroy all disease and to raise the dead, even the self-same Lazarus, the spiritual body, the incorporeal idea, came with the ascension. End quote. We can have no other body than the one perfect incorporeal idea. Man being the compound idea of God, it naturally follows that everything which is included in the consciousness of man must be spiritual and perfect, or it is not the consciousness that God knows, and which man should have. Matter can never be spiritualized, but our mistaken belief which presents itself as matter can be corrected and thus spiritualized. To heal an imperfect heart, which is simply a wrong belief of heart, one must repudiate the testimony of material sense, and claim the presence of God's idea in order to improve his false concept, it is not necessary that he should know just what the divine idea back of the human belief of heart is. All he needs to know is that his mistaken sense of heart, which appears to be material, is not the right one, and that God's idea is present now and here and there is no other. If a man has an unhealthy belief of stomach, the only remedy is to admit the falsity of all that mortal mind says about stomach, and claim possession of God's idea, which is the only perfect reality. All sickness is due to a wrong belief of things, and the only remedy is to get the right idea. Because there is a right idea of heart and a right idea of stomach, we can understand what our leader means when she says, quote, Divine science excludes matter, resolves things into thoughts, and replaces the objects of material sense with spiritual ideas. End quote. Science and Health, page 123. If there were no spiritual ideas with which to replace objects of material sense, our diseased beliefs could never be corrected, and our bodies could not be scientifically healed. God is not separate from his ideas. The right idea of anything carries with it the power and activity of infinite mind, and when brought to bear upon the false belief, 
it produces a harmonious result. If it is true that a wrong belief concerning body manifests itself as a disordered material condition, then the right idea which corrects the false belief must produce an improved physical manifestation. We can never heal by attempting to exercise the power of truth on a sick body. It is the exercise of the power of truth on a belief of sickness that produces the healing results. Christian science is an exact science, and as such it will permit of no deviation from its principle and rule. It demands that the student, in order to demonstrate its truth, must be able to meet its requirements. Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then a knowledge of the truth of what Christian science teaches is absolutely necessary to its demonstration. We are all laboring more or less under the belief that man is a human being separated from his Creator, with a mind and an intelligence all his own. This belief must be destroyed, and the only way to accomplish its destruction is by constantly holding in thought the right idea, and by declaring the presence and activity of all the ideas of God. As these ideas become more real to us, we shall find our human sense of things disappearing, and ourselves growing more like Him, more like infinite wisdom, more like truth and love. Then shall it come to pass, as Isaiah prophesied, that the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. End of Possession by Adam H. Dickey Recorded by November 8 Echo Victor Victor In the Christian Science Reading Room, Centerville, Ohio The Three Kinds of Men by G. K. Chesterton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jerome Lawson The Three Kinds of Men by G. K. Chesterton Roughly speaking, there are three kinds of people in this world. The first kind of people are people. They're the largest and probably the most valuable class. We owe to this class the chairs we sit down on, the clothes we wear, the houses we live in, and indeed, when we come to think of it, we probably belong to this class ourselves. The second class may be called, for convenience, the poets. They are often a nuisance to their families, but, generally speaking, a blessing to mankind. The third class is that of the professors or intellectuals, sometimes described as the thoughtful people, and these are a blight and a desolation, both to their families and also to mankind. Of course, the classification sometimes overlaps, like all classification. Some good people are almost poets, and some bad poets are almost professors. But the division follows lines of real psychological cleavage. I do not offer it lightly. It has been the fruit of more than eighteen minutes of earnest reflection and research. The class called people, to which you and I, with no little pride, attach ourselves, has certain casual, yet profound assumptions, which are called commonplaces, as that children are charming, or that twilight is sad and sentimental, or that one man fighting three is a fine sight. Now these feelings are not crude, they are not even simple. The charm of children is very subtle, it is even complex, to the extent of being almost contradictory. It is, at its very plainest, mingled of a regard for hilarity and a regard for helplessness. The sentiment of twilight, in the vulgarest drawing-room song or the coarsest pair of sweethearts, is, so far as it goes, a subtle sentiment. It is strangely balanced between pain and pleasure. It might also be called pleasure-tempting pain. The plunge of impatient chivalry by which we all admire a man fighting odds, is not at all easy to define separately. It means many things. Pity, dramatic surprise, a desire for justice, a delight in experiment and the indeterminate. The ideas of the mob are really very subtle ideas, but the mob does not express them subtly. In fact, it does not express them at all, except on those rare occasions, now only too rare, when it indulges in insurrection and massacre. Now, this accounts for the otherwise unreasonable fact of the existence of poets. Poets are those who share these popular sentiments, but can so express them that they prove themselves the strange and delicate things that they really are. 
poets draw out the shy refinements of the rabble. Where the common man covers the queerest emotions by saying, Rum little kid, Victor Hugo will write, L'art d'Italie grand père. Where the stockbroker will only say abruptly, Evening's closing in now, Mr. Yates will write, Into the twilight. Where the navvy can only mutter something about pluck and being precious game, Homer will show you the hero in rags in his own hall, defying the princes at their banquet. The poets carry the popular sentiments to a keener and more splendid pitch, but let it always be remembered that it is the popular sentiments that they are carrying. No man ever wrote any good poetry to show that childhood was shocking, or that twilight was gay and farcical, or that a man was contemptible because he had crossed a single sword with three. The people who maintain this are the professors, or prigs. The poets are those who rise above the people by understanding them. Of course, most of the poets write in prose, Rabelais, for instance, and Dickens. The prigs rise above the people by refusing to understand them, by saying that all their dim, strange preferences are prejudices and superstitions. The prigs make the people feel stupid. The poets make the people feel wiser than they could have imagined that they were. There are many weird elements in this situation. The oddest of all, perhaps, is the fate of the two factors in practical politics. The poets who embrace and admire the people are often pelted with stones and crucified. The prigs who despise the people are often loaded with lands and crowned. In the House of Commons, for instance, there are quite a number of prigs, but comparatively few poets. There are no people there at all. By poets, as I have said, I do not mean people who write poetry, or indeed people who write anything. I mean such people as, having culture and imagination, use them to understand and share the feelings of their fellows, as against those who use them to rise to what they call a higher plane. Crudely, the poet differs from the mob by his sensibility. The professor differs from the mob by his insensibility. He has not sufficient finesse and sensitiveness to sympathize with the mob. His only notion is coarsely to contradict it, to cut across it, in accordance with some egotistical plan of his own, to tell himself that, whatever the ignorant say, they are probably wrong. He forgets that ignorance often has the exquisite intuitions of innocence. Let me take one example, which may mark out the outline of the contention. Open the nearest comic paper, and let your eye rest lovingly upon a joke about a mother-in-law. Now the joke, as presented for the populace, will probably be a simple joke. The old lady will be tall and stout, the henpecked husband will be small and cowering. But for all that, a mother-in-law is not a simple idea. She is a very subtle idea. The problem is not that she is big and arrogant. She is frequently little, and quite extraordinarily nice. The problem of the mother-in-law is that she is like the twilight, half one thing, and half another. Now this twilight truth, this fine and even tender embarrassment, might be rendered as it really is, by a poet, but only here the poet would have to be some very penetrating and sincere novelist, like George Meredith, or Mr. H. G. Wells, whose Anne Veronica I have just been reading with delight. I would trust the fine poets and novelists, because they would follow the very clue given them in comic cuts. But suppose the professor appears, and suppose he says, as he almost certainly will, a mother-in-law is merely a fellow citizen. Considerations of sex should not interfere with comradeship. Regard for age should not influence the intellect. A mother-in-law is merely another mind. We should free ourselves from these tribal hierarchies and degrees. Now, when the professor says this, as he always does, I say to him, Sir, you are coarser than comic cuts. You are more vulgar and blundering than the most elephantine musical artiste. You are blinder and grosser than the mob. These vulgar knockabouts have, at least, got hold of a social shade and real mental distinction, though they can only express it clumsily. You are so clumsy that you cannot get hold of it at all. If you really cannot see that the bridegroom's mother and the bride have any reason for constraint or diffidence, then you are neither polite nor humane. You have no sympathy in you for the deep and doubtful hearts of human folk. It is better even to put the difficulty as the vulgar put it, than to be partly unconscious of the difficulty altogether. The same question might be considered well enough in the old proverb that two is company and three is none. This proverb is the truth, but popularly. That is, it is the truth put wrong. Certainly it is untrue that three is no company. Three is splendid company. Three is the ideal number for pure comradeship, as in the three musketeers. But if you reject the proverb altogether, if you say that two and three are the same sort of company, 
if you cannot see that there is a wider abyss between two and three than between three and three million, then I regret to inform you that you belong to the third class of human beings, that you shall have no company, either of two or three, but shall be alone in a howling desert till you die.'